Oops, three, two, one. Ready, set, here I go. Hey, everybody. Tonight we're debating Islam versus Judaism, and we are starting right now with David's opening statement. Thanks for being with us, David. Making the case for Judaism, the floor is all yours, David. Okay, great. So uh, hopefully get the slide share going and uh, appreciate James inviting me and Daniel for allowing me to uh, defend Judaism and uh, my great passion in life, debate and Judaism. So I will be doing my best to uh, present Judaism to a wide audience of people that, uh, you know, from all levels of knowledge. So um, Judaism is very difficult to explain for multiple reasons. And uh, we are specifically debating, is Islam or Judaism true? So I'll be trying to present the true claims of Judaism. And the difficulty in presenting this is because most Jews don't actually believe the true claims. And Judaism is an ethnic group and a religion. And even among religious Jews, there's so many sectarians. So uh, uh, thought through the best of my ability in a way to present this that makes sense where people, you know, if you know fellow Jews or you know uh, people, you know, the benefit of these debates, treat people the way they want to be treated. And understanding their belief system is a precursor to treating people the way they want to be treated. So I've laid out, um, you know, I have up here, uh, you know, Kevin McDonald's famous culture of critique, evolutionary psychology, Judaism as a group strategy, as opposed to the sages and, uh, or, you know, various levels of Jews and how they understand Judaism. So a little table of content of some of the things I want to cover, where we'll look at uh, the nature of truth, uh, the criterion, the various types of Judaism, some of the central tenets. Uh, we'll look at why people want to be Jewish if they don't actually believe in the truth of Judaism, and some of uh, the main ways that uh, the truth, the basic principles of Judaism have been laid out, a little bit on Kabbalah and mysticism, uh, on Zionism, anti-Semitism, and the Holocaust. And then finally, we'll look at how Judaism understands Islam and uh, and then some of the key differences between Judaism and Islam. And then the final question, is Judaism true? So you know, question most of you are probably asking, why you? And if you're a uh, Jewish YU stands for Yeshiva University. And, you know, Yeshiva, it's me because I love Judaism and I've dedicated my life to the study of Judaism and promoting Judaism. And it's my great honor. And, um, you know, I studied under uh, great rabbis. I served rabbis in Brooklyn and Israel. And uh, people could uh, check my channel or talk about it at a different time. The debate's not about me. And just to mention, because my first time on um, modern day debate, I went to University of Michigan and I had helped found the Baki Yoga Society with the uh, Siddharth Siddhari, who had been on Modern Day Debate a few years ago defending reincarnation. And we used to have long conversations about uh, theology and various issues. And I'm also a chess coach in Metro Detroit, and I have regularly Muslim students. And uh, to some aspect, I regularly actually defend Islam. So I will not uh, be attacking Islam other than to say that I believe Judaism is more true. And uh, if people are familiar with me, I stream with uh, Jennifer Church of Entropy on her channel for years, a uh, week in review. So what is truth? What's the criterion to assess whether Judaism or Islam is true? So you know, up here, according to modern philosophy or the ancients, the Greeks, there's three main schools of truth, the correspondence theory of truth, the coherence theory of truth, and pragmatism. And there, there's more theories, but uh, basically any of these criterion, um, I would say me and Daniel should both be able to defend within that, uh, you know, does Judaism correspond to reality? Are the principles of Judaism internally coherent uh, without contradiction? And is it pragmatic? And uh, I also have my own truth theory called the multiple truth hypothesis that uh, I actually founded uh, from interfaith with Islam. You mentioned that I've been doing interfaith for over 25 years and uh, with the Muslims, I've read the Quran multiple times. I have a substantial amount of books on Islam and uh, assessing the truth claims the, uh, between Islam and Judaism. How do you go about doing that? So from a religious point of view, you have doctrinal claims, theological claims, the nature of the origin of the soul, the destination of the soul, 
uh, concepts like atonement, reward and punishment, karma, cosmology, eschatology. These are all fundamental claims that Judaism has, uh, but within a religious doctrine as opposed to science or philosophy, generally we believe that there's scripture, there's prophecy, there's sages, that God communicates the man. And to some extent, uh, the truth claim would be all scripture is truth. That truth could be derived by any of the accepted scripture, and even uh, the major sages, uh, even uh, you know, according to some sects, through this generation. And uh, although the, you know the Talmudic uh, wisdom is that scripture speaks within the language of man, and then specifically within Islam and Judaism, you have forms of scriptural exegesis and biblical hermeneutics. Uh, but from that perspective, any statement. From the scripture or even the Talmud or a rabbi could be understood as a truth claim that needs to be defended. So the difficulty of understanding Judaism is all the types of Judaism, and especially when considering truth claims, because generally only a very few Jews actually believe, so to say, the fundamental truths. Classically, uh, in the West, you had Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform where Orthodox believe that the scripture is divine origin, uh, the law is binding, the rabbis have authority, even a full rejection of modernity and some form of sages of the generation with an unbroken tradition to the prophets that interpret uh, scripture and law. So the vast majority of Jews reject this. And uh, you know, reform, the basic tenet was to fully reject the divine origin of scripture, that law is non-binding, um, and you basically, well, I'm a Jew. I believe my ancestors were Jewish and the traditions have meaning. It was the best that people knew at the time. But if there's a contradiction between a traditional Judaism and enlightenment values or science, that the vast majority of Jews go with the enlightenment values and science. In fact, I've heard Daniel mention this critique many times. So you know, very confusing. If you know Jews, most Jews do not follow the actual truth claims of Judaism, but are more likely to follow enlightenment values or things like science and evolution. And also, uh, in the last few decades, Chabad and Zionism have uh, kind of blurred the lines where the classical division between Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox are less clear. And now, you know, Zionism could be a major classification. And I personally classify myself as a Hasidic Jew. Okay, so what are the central tenets of Judaism? Um, and another problem with Judaism, as opposed to Islam, is that Judaism is not essentially a religion of belief. It's a religion of practice. So generally, when you convert to Judaism, um, there is no acceptance of dogma. Like Islam, Judaism is an acceptance of following the rituals in the law and swearing of loyalty to the Jewish people. Uh, and beliefs are just one aspect of the law. And Jewish law encompasses all aspects of life. So that, you know, for how you, how you get up in the morning, how you use the restroom, what you eat, how you interact with uh, people, there's aspects of Jewish law recommendations for basically every single aspect of life. I'll mention um, there was a debate, and we'll talk about Maimonides, uh, influenced by Islam and uh, the Greeks and Aristotle tried to lay out Judaism similar to the way the Muslims laid out Islam with fundamental belief tenets and everything else being derived from those. And although Maimonides is respected and his literature is studied, Jewish law did not follow Maimonides. Jewish law generally follows um starting with uh, daily practice. So there's not, uh, you know, Judaism does not start with the fundamental beliefs. Judaism starts what you should do if you, when you get up in the morning, uh, the laws, and there, there are statements. So, you know, what's the fundamental tenet of Judaism? Rabbi Kiva says, this is the great principle of Torah. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hillel taught that which is hateful to you. Do not uh, do to your fellow. That is the whole of Torah. All the rest is commentary. Now go and learn it. So, uh, um, although you could find other statements that will say other things are the central tenet of Judaism. Um, in terms of truth claims, you could divide certain divisions like the historical claims 
of Judaism, which, you know, from the biblical narrative to the rabbinic narrative and, uh, you know, hagiography of the saints and sages, uh, that, uh, you know, from the fundamental perspective, I would be willing to defend, yes, the stories in the Bible are true. Uh, even the stories in the Talmud or the rabbinic literature, literature are also largely true. However, the vast majority of Jews reject it and say these are legends, are foundational legends. But one fundamental truth claim is central, basically, to anybody who calls themselves a Jew, and that there is something fundamental, the Jewish people, and that uh, I'm calling myself a Jew. I believe that I'm descended from the ancient Israelites, you know, whoever wrote the Bible, whoever lived in ancient Israel, according to uh, the temple and the sages, that's who I'm descended from. And, you know, certain level, if there's a covenant between God and the Jewish people, uh, other major aspects of Judaism that are important to acknowledge is in-group preference. Judaism has strict laws uh, and a difference between how Jews treat fellow Jews and how Jews treat the rest of humanity. Although there are fundamental laws that govern interaction with all people that should be according to a minimal moral and ethical standard, there's a much higher level that is required for how Jews treat uh, fellow Jews. And I'm not sure that might be a difference with Islam. Also, most of the sages, Judaism believes in free will. God is slow to anger, gives people a long time to repent, and um, there's fundamental reward and punishment so that uh, you have these boom and bust cycles where God allows people to act wickedly and gives people a long time to repent. But if people don't repent, eventually calamity comes to the earth and Judaism largely understands history through these boom and bust cycles of mankind um, choosing the path of wickedness, God wanting us to repent and return to the proper path. And over a long period of time, should we not repent, God forbid, uh, calamity coming to the earth. Also say truism. Judaism is full of truism, wit, wisdom from the sages. And, uh, you know, there's great literature of, uh, you know, just fundamental statements of interaction, uh, you know, nature, uh, karma. And in classical Judaism, truth is not put forward in the same way as modern Judaism. Truth is related to the quality of honesty and as a character trait. Truth is a character trait. A person is honest because their speech matches their action. They don't cheat people. They're uh, honest in their dealings, mostly related to business dealings where a person could cause damage. So why be Jewish? Why is it that most Jews reject the truth claims of Judaism but still ascribe to Judaism? So one of the most famous debates in the ancient world was between Philo of Alexander and the Roman emperor Caligula. And, uh, you know, there were problems. There was before the... Uh, the time of Jesus before the destruction and Caligula had issues with the Jews and he brings the biggest sage of the Jews at the time, Philo, who defends the Jews. And Philo largely describes the Jews as the demiurge, uh, which uh, you know is platonic. There's different ways to understand it, but in Philo's understanding, um, Jews are the force, positive force of progress in humanity. And I would say most Jews agree with this. So most people who, uh, even if a secular Jew, Israeli, uh, reformed Jew generally agree that there's something good about the Jewish people and history is moving forward, progress, possibly to utopian messianic era. And the Jews are fundamentally a force that causes humanity to progress. So I would say this is one of the fundamental tenets of belief that crosses the board between Orthodox to secular Jews. Also, why be Jewish? Just pragmatism. Judaism works. Uh, like Elon Musk said, he's aspirationally Jewish. He sees Jewish people that you know, we're intellectual, we work hard, to um, secular Jews. We help each other out. Judaism is a method for a good life, uh, preserves ancestral traditions, oh, life cycle rituals, add meaning to life, gather extended family and community. There's support network. Judaism believes in charity, uh, especially helping out fellow Jews. So if you're Jewish, there's uh, you know always charities involved. There's a uh, federations and organizations, you know, the ADL and, you know, let alone nursing homes and uh, job services to uh, you know, to uh, help people. And also because Judaism is also an ethnicity that uh, you don't have to be a believing Jew. You could uh, you know, move back and forth between Judaism and uh, Judaism is hard to escape. And so, you know, if you don't want to be Jewish, you could be a secular Jew 
uh, but you know, I, I, most Jews have no interest in converting to other religions. So we'll take a pragmatic approach to Judaism. So one of the greatest books ever written in Judaism, Duties of the Heart, from a fundamental level, Judaism is about loving and fearing God. Um, and probably Daniel will agree with this 100%. All of these principles, Judaism, monotheistic, there is, don't believe in other gods. Everything is one. Everything is a force from God. There are no alternative forces, even evil or bad people. Everything is uh, connected directly to God. And these are supposed to maintain in the heart where in your heart at every instance, you should love and fear and believe in God. Uh, Maimonides tried to lay out Judaism, you know, the prayer book for years. I said this every morning. I chanted these. I had these memorized. Uh, many Jews will sing these. The 13 principles of faith. Um, Muslims probably agree with the vast majority. Uh, one aspect is Moses is the greatest of the prophets and the oral Torah. Uh, you will probably get into the question of whether the uh, prophecies in the hand of the Jews today are accurate, which most Muslims believe have changed. And Judaism believes in eventual Messiah and revival of the dead. There's Kabbalah and mysticism, kind of like the God's eye perspective. So Judaism, kind of like truth, from the God's eye perspective, man can't know truth. Man should just submit and serve. We can know a certain amount revealed through scripture. But at the end of the day, truth is from the God's eye perspective. But Kabbalah in mysticism tries to give some perspective of what is the God's eye perspective, the nature of the soul, what happens before and after death. It has a system of transmigration of souls, saying that from beginning of creation till Messiah comes, that there is a lifetime of repair the world, Tikkun Olam, where the purpose, purpose in life is fulfilled over multiple lifetimes. So uh, you could consider these truth claims. And a lot of Jews uh, you know, believe in Kabbalah and mysticism, even if they reject other aspects of it. Uh, another important aspect is the nature of evil and suffering. From an Orthodox perspective, anti-Semitism is part of being the chosen people. The, you know, the Talmud says very clearly, Mount Sinai, the word Sinai means hatred. When God chose the Jewish people, it caused all the other nations to hate us. And also how Jews 20 seconds. Uh, classically understand Islam and Christianity uh, in terms of uh, the Abraham and his children. Um, and you know, the Maimonides, we can come back to this later, but uh, a specific way of Islam coming to uh, prophecy that uh, you know, Abraham had multiple children, of Ishmael that leads to Islam and, Christ and Esau and that leads to Christianity. And uh, if you one second, just look at this last slide. Uh, there's it's been 17 minutes. I do. I can give Daniel the same amount of time over, but it has been a. Let him uh, finish. Let him finish his presentation. Or, or, so, can you hear me? Hey, James, right, okay. Just, so I'll, I'll just, uh, have him finish the presentation. Slide. It's like one slide left. And you know there are multiple okay. theological differences with Islam, and we could come back to this. All these are very interesting. Um, you know, the look at hypocrisy, which Islam sees as fundamentally uh, horrible, as Judaism looks at not that bad. Questions of uh, children being punished for the sins of their parents or communal guilt, uh, you know, other issues like usury, um, you know, all these we could look at. And the question, is Judaism true? And to say that uh, pragmatically, Judaism is a method for a happy, healthy, successful life. And uh, so, you know, Judaism and works. time again. Okay, appreciate that. We're going to kick it into the opening statement from Daniel as well with that. Want to say, folks, if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button as we have any more debates to come. And thanks very much for being with us as well. Daniel, the floor is all yours. Wait, uh, James, I have to. Is is there like a lag on the stream? Or is you usually about any, a 20, like... 25 second delay between what's live and what's shown on YouTube? Uh... Sorry, uh, just one second. I don't know why I'm getting an error on my stream. Uh, I, th I think people can still see, so uh, let me just go into the presentation. Hold on. Yeah, in the meantime, folks, there is a poll in the live chat. If you had to choose between Islam or Judaism, just those two, which would you choose? Check out that poll right now in the Modern Day Debate live chat. That, let's get over to Daniel for his opening. Share my 
my screen. Ready. Oh, there it is. All right, one second. Okay. First of all, um, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Just want to thank uh, Duvid for doing this debate. I really appreciate um, him and giving that presentation and being willing to debate. So I think we're gonna have a good conversation. Oh, see, I knew I forgot something. My volume is very low. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I just, uh, to repeat, I wanna thank David uh, for doing this debate. I'm excited to have a conversation with him about these very important issues. Did you know that Jude, that in Jewish scripture, God is described as a bearded rabbi and that he has a big penis. Did you know in those texts, you will also find references to God having sons and a wife. Jewish scripture also allows, um, Jewish scripture also allows demon worship, prescribes certain magical spells and promotes astrology. Also, according to Jewish texts, Jews are a divine race, but God cursed black people. Also, according to traditional Jewish law, if a Jewish man sexually assaults a Gentile woman as young as three, she should be put to death. All of this and much more is found in Judaism. This is why Judaism is inferior as a religion compared to Islam. The truth is, Jews and Muslims agree on many things. We agree that God sent the prophet Moses to the Israelites with Revelation and the Mosaic Law. Jews and Muslims also agree that the big problem with the Jewish people is that throughout history, they continuously depart from this revelation by falling into idolatry and corrupting their religion. This is the main theme of the Bible, actually. God tells the Israelites to worship him alone and not be tempted into adopting the religion of others. But the Israelites can't help themselves. Whether they end up bowing down to a golden calf or to the goddess Ashtoreth, the Jewish people betray their covenant with God and God punishes them. This is what the Bible says over and over again. And Muslims are 100% agreed on this because this is what the Quran affirms. In verse 930, referring to the Jews and people of the book, they were condemned for breaking their covenant, rejecting Allah's signs, killing the prophets unjustly, and for saying, our hearts are unreceptive. The main difference between Muslims and Jews is that Jews believe that despite their long history of lapses, they have ultimately retained the God-given Mosaic law uncorrupted. But the Islamic position is that the Mosaic law and revelation have been corrupted beyond repair. The damage is too deep and too fundamental. There is no way to remove all the pollution. This is why a final revelation is needed. That is Islam, and that is what I'm inviting Dovid and other Jews to accept. For the rest of my opening, I want to demonstrate the depth of corruption found in the Jewish scripture. Basically, both the Bible and the Quran describe how Jews were susceptible to corrupting their religion and adopting polytheism. The reality that this corruption has taken place is evident when we find absurdities in Jewish scriptures. We can see the corruption with our own eyes. I will focus on five examples, polytheism, anthropomorphism, racism, demon worship, and magic. Then I'll give two reasons why Judaism is so susceptible at a systemic level to such corruption. Let's go through the five examples first. Polytheism. The first myth we have to dispel is the idea that Judaism was always monotheistic. According to Jewish belief, the prophet Moses lived roughly around 1500 BCE, but archaeological evidence shows that prior to the 6th century BCE, most Jews were overt polytheists who worshipped Yahweh slash El and his divine consort Asherah. The evidence for this are ancient artifacts found at Kuntalet Adrud in Egypt and Khirbat El Qom near Hebron. So between 1500 BCE and 600 BCE, the alleged followers of Moses had introduced a great deal of idol worship into their religion. The polytheism of these early Jews is discussed in many academic works, like Mark Smith's The Origins of Biblical Monotheism. Prior to the Second Temple period, many Jews had beliefs which resembled that of the neighboring Canaanites. 
these Jews believed in a polytheistic pantheon of deities with four levels. At the top was the chief god and his wife, El and Asherah. At the second level were their 70 divine children. Each of the 70 divine children of El and Asherah was assigned rule over a particular people. Yahweh is regarded as one of these divine children, and he is assigned to rule over the people of Israel. Then afterwards, Yahweh, the god of the Jewish people, came to be seen as the supreme god, El. These polytheistic ideas are found in the scriptures, which eventually became the books of the Bible. However, they were gradually edited out over time, but we can still see the remnants of this polytheism enshrined in different variants of the Bible. Consider two examples from the work of Bible scholar Emmanuel Tov. In Deuteronomy 32, 8, we read, When the Most High apportioned the nations, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. This translation is based on the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible, but the Masoretic text is just one of the multiple variants of the Hebrew Bible. When we look at other variants like the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Septuagint, the last word of this verse is different. When the Most High apportioned the nations, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Professor Emmanuel Tov explains that this textual discrepancy, quote, reflects a conscious intervention in the text by a scribe uncomfortable with the polytheistic picture of divine beings, and thus that scribe demythologized the original polytheistic description by replacing the word God with Israel. Another example is Deuteronomy 32, 43. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, the verse reads, Acclaim, O heavens, with him, bow to him, all you gods, meaning the gods are supposed to bow to the head god. The Masoretic text changes the word gods to people in order to avoid the polytheistic implication. We don't even have to go to other variants of the Bible to find polytheism, however. For example, in Exodus 15, 11, Moses declares, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? The phrase among the gods implies there are multiple gods who exist, but Yahweh is superior to those other gods. Psalm 82, 1 reads, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Psalm 86, 8 reads, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord. These passages are not monotheistic. They're polytheistic, or more specifically, he Theistic. The idea that you can recognize multiple gods exist, but only one god is worshipped. The Bible also references the idea of God having children. In Psalm 82, 27, we read, And I will appoint David to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. Psalm 45 goes even further. We read, Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. In other words, the verse addresses the king as a god who has been anointed by the supreme god. This notion of divine kingship is found in many cultures. For example, the Egyptian pharaoh, the Roman emperor, and the Chinese emperor are considered the sons of higher gods. The Hebrew Bible borrowed this pagan idea. Even until the 4th century CE, many Jews worshipped a lesser god called Metatron in addition to the highest god. This was known as two powers in heaven. Rabbinic Judaism later came to consider this a heresy, but remnants of the idea are still found in the Talmud. In the Avoda Zara 3b, the Talmud describes how God spends part of the day teaching children, but sometimes Metatron takes the place of God to do this. Metatron is literally sharing in the actions of God, according to the Talmud. Now, anthropomorphism. Moving on from polytheism, we see that Judaism has a long history of depicting God in highly anthropomorphic and corporeal ways. This is most evident prior to the Second Temple period. Archaeological evidence indicates that Yahweh slash El was often represented in the form of a golden bull. Remnants of this are found in the Bible. For example, in Numbers 24, 8, when translated literally, it says, God who brought Israel out of Egypt has horns like a wild fox like a wild ox. It was also believed that God has a giant penis, which was a sign of his power and virility. This was due to the influence of Babylonian creation myths that described the warrior god Marduk defeating a female sea monster by shooting an arrow from his great weapon into her throat. Biblical scholar Francesca Stavrakopoulou claims that this great weapon was considered a phallic symbol by the Babylonians. The Bible mirrors this story as well by referencing God's victories over sea monsters. And in the Bible, Habakkuk 3.9, the verse translated literally says, God, you brandish your bow of nakedness. You satisfy the shafts of your bowstring. This appears to be attributing the same phallic symbolism to the God of the Bible. Later, Jewish mysticism, i.e. Kabbalah, builds on the notion that God has a human-like body, including a penis. 
During the second temple period, much of the language about God's body was edited out of the Bible, but some still remains. For example, the current Bible depicts God as a bearded old man. In Daniel 7, 9, we read, As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. In the Talmud, Bava Batra 58a, God is described as resembling Adam, since Genesis 1.27 says Adam was created in God's image. And furthermore, Adam resembles a rabbi. So this implies that God no, not only has a human form, but he specifically resembles a rabbi. Besides this crude anthropomorphism, both the Torah and the Talmud describe God as being ignorant or lacking omniscience. For example, in Genesis 3, 9 through 13, God asks questions about Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit as if he doesn't know the answers. In Genesis, we read, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. If God was regretful, this implies that God did not have foreknowledge about the consequences of creating mankind. Perhaps these verses are metaphorical and shouldn't be understood as God literally being, being ignorant, but the Talmud reiterates the idea of divine regret in Sukkah 52b which says that God regrets creating four things, including Ishmaelites. Interestingly, Ishmaelites means Arabs. So the Talmud is saying God regrets creating Arabs. Apparently, the God of Judaism is a racist. The Hebrew Bible also depicts God as being limited in his power. For example, Genesis 2.2 says that God rested on the seventh day from the work he had done. It's not clear how an omnipotent being requires rest. The Bible also depicts God as getting into conflicts with beings like Jacob and sea monsters. In some cases, God is defeated, like in the case of God wrestling Jacob with, uh, with Jacob and being defeated by Jacob. And in other cases, God wins, for example, against the sea monsters. If God is omnipotent, how is it that he wrestles and battles with lesser beings and sometimes he even loses to them? Racism. Now let's move on to how Judaism depicts Jews as a superior race above non-Jews. The basis for this is the Torah. Deuteronomy 7, 6, which says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his treasured people out of all the peoples upon the face of the earth. The word holy was understood to mean that Jews are actually divine in some sense. The Talmud further teaches that non-Jews are not to be regarded as humans or treated as such. In the Babylonian Talmud, Bava Metziah 114b, we read, Jewish people are called man, but Gentiles are not called man. The Talmud Oh, sorry, I'm going ahead. The Talmud also says, uh, teaches that all non-Jews are like snakes. Kill the best of Gentiles, smash the head of the best of snakes. Other texts like the Zohar and other Kabbalistic writings hold that Jews have divine souls that are connected to God, but non-Jews lack souls connected to God and are demonic. The notion that non-Jews are animals is also reflected in Jewish laws. For instance, if an adult male ra Jew rapes a non-Jewish girl as young as three years old, the girl is to be executed. This is because, according to Jewish law, when a Jew has sex with an animal, that animal must be put to death. Since the raped non-Jewish child is like an animal, she is likewise put to death. This rule is mentioned in the Mishnah Torah by Maimonides, who is considered to be the greatest scholar of Jewish law. Maimonides writes, if a Jewish male enters into relations with a Gentile woman, when he does so intentionally, she should be executed. She is executed because she caused a Jew to be involved in an unseemly transgression, as is the law with regard to an animal. This applies regardless of whether the Gentile woman was a minor of three years of age or an adult. Although Jewish texts denigrate all non-Jews as subhuman, they single out black people for special insult. One key passage in the Talmud is Sanhedrin 108b, which claims that Noah's son Ham committed a sin, and for this reason he and his descendants are cursed with having black skin. This is known as the curse of Ham. So demon worship. Not only did most Jews historically worship multiple gods, they also worshipped and made sacrifices to demons. Demon worship is reflected in one of the most central rituals in traditional Judaism, namely that of the scapegoat undertaken at the temple on Yom Kippur, the holiest day in Judaism. In Leviticus, we read about a ritual involving two goats. One of the goats is sacrificed to Yahweh, and the other goat is sacrificed to a demon or fallen angel known as Azazel. This second goat has the sins of the Jewish people transferred onto its body before it's killed. After the destruction of the temple, Jews began performing a similar ritual with a chicken instead of a goat, placing their sins on the chicken and then killing it, what's called kaparot. In the Talmud, Maila 17b, a Jewish rabbi seeks help from a demon called Ben Temelion. To be fair, the Talmud has contrary opinions on whether it's permissible to seek help from demons by consulting them about hidden matters. This involves making food offerings to them, such as oil, eggs, and sweets. The Shulchan Aruch says that some rabbis permitted consulting with demons.
In Barachot 6a, the Talmud describes a magical ritual that can be used to see demons that involves placing fine ash around one's bed. Another way to see demons is to burn the afterbirth of a firstborn female black cat. Magic. The Talmud also permits magical amulets. Some of the amulets that the Talmud mentioned include a coin pressed against a wound to heal it, a takuma or preserving stone which was worn by a woman to prevent miscarriage, a locust egg, the tooth of a fox. The Talmud also recommends the use of certain magical spells. Some of these incantations are described in the Pesachim 112a and Shabbat 67a. The Shulchan Aruch affirms that magical spells are permissible to use. Finally, the Talmud actually endorses a form of astrology. Shabbat 156a explains that if you are born on the second day of the week, you will be a short-tempered person, but if you're born on the third day, you will be rich and promiscuous. So what are the reasons for systemic corruption? So of course, all of these things I've mentioned are categorically rejected in Islam. There is not a whiff of polytheism, God having children, God having a penis, making sacrifices to demons, or anything else even close to that in the Quran or Hadith. In fact, Islamic scripture explicitly denounces all these things, and that's because Islam has preserved its strict monotheism and successfully warded off the polytheistic influences of other religions and cultures. The same, unfortunately, cannot be said for Judaism, and this is why Judaism shares many of the polytheistic elements found in other Near Eastern religions. There are many reasons, or there are two main reasons I should say for this. First, Jewish religious texts have not been preserved and are not authentic. The fact that the Hebrew Bible has constantly changed is proven by the significantly different variants available, like the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, the Targum, and the Masoretic Text. In fact, the Hebrew Bible only took a final form when the Masoretic Text was fixed between the 6th and the 10th century CE, and that was partly due to Muslim influence. The Talmud is even worse. The rabbis continuously created new opinions that were falsely attributed to Moses. Or more specifically, the opinions were back projected onto early rabbis who were believed to have received those opinions from Moses. This is how the Talmud and Tosefta were produced. This was actually recognized by Jewish groups themselves, such as the Sadducees and the Karaites. It was only around the 7th and 8th centuries that the Babylonian Talmud began to take a standard form, and it was only around the 9th century that it was actually written down. Before then, Jews claim it was orally transmitted for centuries. This is why there are no manuscripts of the Babylonian Talmud before the 9th, 9th century, and the Babylonian and Jerusalem variants of the Talmud have significant differences. Unlike Jewish scripture, the Islamic scripture has been preserved and is authentic, and non-Muslim academics will testify to this. Manuscript radiocarbon and dating has proven objectively that the text of the Quran we read today existed at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu When the core religious text is preserved, this makes it virtually impossible to introduce new doctrines that diverge significantly from the text. The second reason Judaism has been prone to corruption is that rabbis usurp God's authority in many ways. Rabbis claim that in the Bible, God has given them the power to make new laws in the form of takanot, or positive enactments, and gezerot, or preventative enactments. To make matters worse, the Talmud indicates that rabbis have the power to overrule God and ignore his intentions. This is the doctrine of the Torah is not in heaven that's elaborated in Bava Metzia 59b, Menachot 29b, and the Pesikta Rabati. According to the Talmud, God even concedes that the rabbis have triumphed over him. These doctrines all but guarantee that Judaism will be corrupted at the whims of men. This is why Judaism has a long history of polytheism, demon worship, and other bizarre beliefs. Islam, by contrast, has preserved its texts and it actively teaches its adherents that any innovation in the religion is punished by hellfire. This is why Islam remains unchanged over 1400 years in its theology, rituals, and values. Of course, this means that Islam is considered backwards according to the degenerate and ever-changing standards of modernity. But for those who care about seeking God and following his commandments, then Islam is the straight path. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that opening statement, Daniel. We're going to kick it into the rebuttals. I want to say, folks, thanks so much for your questions. If you happen to have a question for the Q&A, which will come after the open dialogue tonight, feel free to submit it in the live chat, either at by tagging me with modern day debate or using the old super chat feature. With that, thanks very much. We're going to jump into this first rebuttal from David. This is seven minutes. Thanks so much, David. The floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, 
Okay, a lot to cover. And, uh, you know, first I'll mention that uh, I don't think Daniel misrepresented any scripture. The, there's thousands of pages. Thank God the sages, uh, most of them wrote shelves of books. Um, I mentioned 300 years ago, there was a, my, a man, Eisenmanger in Dutch, uh, who almost converted to Judaism and then decided not to. And he wrote a 3,000 page book called Judaism on Mask that is just full of quotes that are, um, you know, very difficult for Jews to understand. And, uh, you know, so I'm not saying that Daniel, you know, so I'll, I'll, I've been studying Judaism my whole life. The corpus to understand Jewish literature, even for a scholar, takes a full 20 years to cover all the important uh, Jewish texts and even his statements about. Judaism originally being polytheistic, um, most Israeli scholars, secular archaeologists and Israeli scholars agree with Daniel on that issue. So in terms of truth claims, like I said, most Jews reject the actual fundamental truth claims and would actually agree with Daniel about the polytheistic origins or what ancient Israel was actually like. From a believer's perspective, it is a fundamental tenet that the books of Moses, the prophets we have in front of us today in our scripture are word for word the exact same as they were in ancient times. But in terms of the criticism, like I said, Judaism is not fundamentally a religion of belief, that there's the God's eye perspective, uh, God chose the Jewish people, gave us the law, and how God runs the world, what God's intentions are, man is limited and can't know that. So, uh, you know, Judaism encourages a legal system that has rituals, holidays, and uh, ethics and morality. And we could go through any of these if he wants and these, you know, understanding. Many of these come from thousands of years ago. There was legal systems that, like in Roman times and ancient times, don't uh, correspond to today. And also Judaism has a method, uh, you know, written in Deuteronomy that uh, at, as Moses is passing away, God says, uh, according to Moses, that they should follow the leaders of the generation. Uh, Maimonides, most of the sages, hold Judaism in a dispensational manner, that uh, the method that God chose to be worshipped in ancient time was through a sacrificial temple cult, and after the destruction of the temple, God no longer needed animal sacrifices and desired prayer, although you know, eventually be a third temple that's disputed among Jews uh, how to understand the prophecy, but uh, yes, uh, Daniel is correct uh, that Judaism changes, and we believe that there's sages of the generation that interpret the law and could even somewhat change the law. And uh, you know, so from that perspective, you say, well, if there's something nefarious of Judaism, yeah, there's very troublesome statements, uh, slavery, racism, in-group preference, and uh, we could go through those one by one. But you know, just mention that there's a huge corpus of literature. Uh, the Talmud also has herbal remedies and uh, medical you know, things. Most of the sages up to a few hundred years ago believed in the four humors and uh, various uh, you know, medical things that have been rejected. And like I said, most Jews suffer, you know, uh, deal with the questions of modernity and new wisdom and ancient wisdom and how to understand our past and whether uh, you know, these were things changed. Uh, but I would say fundamentally, that's not what Judaism represents. And if you're going to say, well, you you know, you you know, you read the Talmud, you read the Jewish books, and you saw these statements, or God forbid, you may be looking at the war in Gaza or uh, difficulties with uh, group conflict, and you think that there is nefarious intentions among Jewish people, and you're going to take it back to these statements in the book. But you so look at the totality of the Jewish scripture, the message of Judaism, which overwhelmingly has a system of morals and ethics, and um, you know, and presumably a Muslim would disagree with this. But, you know, fundamentally the, that uh, God chose the Jewish people, uh, made prophecy to Abraham, the world is moving in a certain direction, and the Jewish people are fundamental in the progress of the world. And uh, you know, according to the Mosaic prophecy, Muslims play an important role in that. Uh, Ishmael uh, you know, the, is promised 12 princes, descendants that will come through him. The uh, books of the Bible through Chronicles you know, the, uh, is promised. Are, very careful to carry down the uh, 12 chronology princes, of the descendants of Ishmael. And many leading rabbis and Kabbalists believe that uh, you know, Muslims have an important role, and it could be uh, adversarial at many times, like uh, Khomeini, Nasrallah, 
Uh, many leaders today of the Islamic world are believed to be descendants of Ishmael. Muhammad himself, you say, for the prophet, if uh, was a descendant of Ishmael that's predicted in rabbinic understanding. And to some extent, granting Daniel's criticism, say, yes, Muslims play an important role to keep Jews on track and in line. And from a true perspective, God gave Jews and everybody free will, and we make mistakes. And God is slow to anger, like I said, and allows people to make mistakes, give us a long time to repent. And God forbid, should we not repent, uh, you know, bad things happen. And so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to Daniel how he wants to uh, direct this conversation, if he wants to go through these texts, or if he wants to, uh, you know, claim that uh, he was able to discover some, uh, you know, secret message to Judaism and portray Judaism as opposed to the way Jews understand Judaism. Or, uh, you know, because it sounds like Daniel also is willing to accept that there is some fundamental truth to Judaism. And this fundamental question, it is, uh, you know, the the accuracy of the scripture. Who has an accurate scripture? So I didn't prepare to go uh, verse for verse, but if you wanted, we could also do that. You got it. We'll kick it over to Daniel for his seven-minute rebuttal as well. Thanks very much. Daniel, the floor is all yours. Folks, if you're watching, don't forget to hit that like button. We appreciate your help. Thanks very much, Daniel. Okay, I'm having some audio issues. I'm going to try to talk loudly um, so that people can hear my voice properly. But, um, yeah, I don't know what to say. Again, I think that uh, David here is very unique as far as Jewish uh, apologists go. Um, he's very open, and I think everyone appreciates that just in the comments. So thank you very much, uh, David. Um, but I'm confused, you know, if you can see that there are these distortions, there are these kinds of changes that have been made um, throughout uh, Jewish history. You, you've kind of conceded that there is polytheism uh, that Jews have fallen into. My claim is not just that they've fallen into it, but it's actually been enshrined or it's actually been preserved, that kind of polytheism within the biblical, uh, within the Bible itself, and then the Talmud and then other Midrash, etc. So this is this is a problem because you can't really know what is the religion that Moses brought. You know, what is the, the message? So everything that you said in your presentation about what this is, what Judaism actually is, how do you really know? Presumably, you think that Judaism is not just whatever Jews think it is. Judaism has to go back to Moses, peace be upon him. It has to go to the prophets. It has to go to God's revelation when Moses went uh, on Mount Sinai and, and received that revelation. He received the law. Uh, presumably, that's what you believe. If, if it's not, then correct me if I'm wrong. But the problem, that's why authenticity is so, so important, because if... Um, we can't trace Revelation. We can't trace the Torah or the Pentateuch. We can't tra trace the oral law to Moses. Then all the claims that you made in your presentation, it's a nice presentation, but how, how do we know that this is actually from God? Now, if you want to say that, well, some Jews actually do say that. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just Jewish culture and we're, I mean, this is who we are. The only thing that we really believe is that God promised us, you know, the land of Israel, but we don't really even believe in God, which is something that you acknowledge. Like there are a lot of Jews, a large percentage who fall into that category, even amongst the Orthodox, then, okay, you know, that's a separate conversation. But if you, uh, as a believing Jew, um, do think that Moses' religion uh, God sent his religion to Moses and then it's been passed down through the ages, then you have to address or you have to contend with this authenticity issue. And I think it's it's a defeater, basically, for, for Judaism. And this is what, where the positive argument for Islam comes in, that, uh, well, yes, according to Islam, of course, you know, these texts uh, have been distorted. This is the concept of tahrif. They've been distorted, whether unintentionally or in some cases intentionally, the scribes have um, added or subtracted. And that those changes make the religion inauthentic. So what you claim to be Judaism, oh, this is our belief, you, we believe in being good, etc. That is, you can't really trace that back to a, a prophet, uh, Moses or otherwise. Whereas Muslims can do that. We can do that with the Quran. Arguably, we can do that with Hadith. But, you know, this is something the Quran has been radiocarbon dated uh, to the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can go through that. I've 
pointed out in many of my debates because this is a defining feature or a unique feature of Islam that our scripture is authentic. It can be objectively verified to at least be placed in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad. But you can't even get close, you know, when, with the Masoretic text, the text that was, you know, formalized and, and accepted as the Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text can't be dated. Uh, beyond, you know, uh, earlier than the 4th century CE, let alone 1500 BCE. So this is, this authenticity problem is something that really has to be addressed. Um, if we t are to take Judaism seriously as a religion, um, and I think through my investigation, my research, conversation with other Jews, it's, it hasn't been, no one has been able to address this particular issue. Um, as for the other criticisms that I made, like, okay, the racism, I think that is a problem. I think that's a problem on the basis of that's something that's uh, just inherently um, disgusting, you know, when it comes to religion, to think that you're, you have a chosen people and God has selected them. We can talk more about that. When it comes to magic, I didn't give a scientific critique. I didn't critique uh, the Talmud on the basis of that of science, because I don't believe that science is the end all be all, um, obviously. And in Islam, we do believe that there's magic. But the problem with the magic in the Talmud and these spells and calling on demons is that these things are inviting to polytheism. They're inviting to um, this kind of dark magic and art. In Islam, we acknowledge that magic exists, but it's forbidden. You're forbidden to call on demons. You're forbidden from engaging in spells and incantations and wearing like good luck charms or believing in astrology because that contradicts Tawheed. It contradicts monotheism. And, but yet we find these kinds of polytheistic elements in, in Judaism. So it's not like Judaism is all polytheism. That's not my argument. Judaism has monotheistic elements and it has polytheistic elements. And that's, that polytheism is what spoils the whole thing like it spoils the whole thing because it's proof positive that it's been corrupted the religion of moses has been corrupted and that is why you need a final revelation you need a revelation that has been preserved you need a prophet uh, who comes with that final revelation and leaves that revelation and, and preserves it for our time uh in, in this century so that's that's the argument i don't know if i have more time but you do have a little you have a minute and a half if you want it okay one one other thing uh theme that i want to discuss that i didn't really get a chance to put in the opening statement for lack of time is that it's interesting actually that david points to maimonides and he points to you know some of maimonides's teachings because when we see my maimonides he was influenced by muslims he was influenced by muslims so this idea that judaism is actually older than islam this is not exactly true because the version of Judaism that is most prominent today is a version of Judaism that was invented after Jews, Jews were a minority in Muslim lands. So it's academically acknowledged that Maimonides was heavily influenced by Islamic theologians. And so the, the religion of Maimonides, including the law, the theology, everything, has been influenced by Muslims. And many of the uh, Orthodox Jews who appreciate Judaism, practice it, believe in it, they're practicing a version of Judaism that has been Islamicized. Yet they claim or they think that, oh, Judaism is actually much older than Islam. This is actually not justified by a objective analysis of the, his of the history. You got it. We'll jump into the five minute rebuttals. Thanks very much, David. The floor is yours, folks. If you enjoy these debates, hey, consider sharing them with a friend that also enjoys them. Thanks very much. David, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you for clarifying. As I hadn't seen Daniel's presentation beforehand, so I'll try to speak directly to what he was saying. First of all, yes, I accept, uh, most Jewish scholars accept that Judaism was influenced by Islam. Maimonides, uh, Duties of the Heart, were written in Arabic. Uh, many of the greatest texts to, to lay out Judaism in a logical manner of basic principles with the emphasis of the core principle of monotheism was factually influenced by Islam. And there is some understanding that Islam is an Abrahamic tradition. Um, but it would say that uh, God gives people free will 
and according to Judaism, there might be some generations where the majority of Jewish people fall off the path, but uh, it's understood that there's an unbroken tradition. If someone studied Judaism, you could trace the name of the sages from this generation till Moses, and there's always been sages, there have always been people that kept the message of God, that kept these principles of monotheism, ethics, uh, obedience to the law, love of God, fear of God, uh, regardless of whether the majority of the Jewish people, I mean, whether you want to look at scripture and claim that scripture has polytheistic elements, the sages would definitely disagree with that. And we would have to, you know, sit down with the scripture to look at that, uh, at those exact uh, verses uh, to see how to interpret them. It said that Talmud, the sages say, scripture speaks in the language of man. So uh, you know, just because scripture might speak in a certain way that man speaks, it doesn't mean that that's the message of scripture. And like I've said many times, Judaism understands that man is limited and cannot understand the truth. There's truth from the God's eye perspective and the man's eye perspective. And as long as we're in this human form, our understanding is limited. Although uh, there is a sages of the generation that guide us, that hold on to the truth, that uh, we're willing to die, to be martyred, to uh, uh, do anything to preserve the tradition. And that includes certain fundamental elements. Um, you know, there might be certain elements of racism or things in ancient time, child marriage, and Judaism has advanced. The sages were given the power to um, make certain changes within limits and guidelines to uh, you know, change with the time, just like Judaism incorporated many of the best elements of Islam and most Jews, even if they're not knowledgeable of it, many of our philosophical underpinnings of Judaism does in fact come from Islamic scholars. Uh, and that's one of the benefits of Judaism. I mean, the Quran comes many years later. So even if you accept that uh, from a Judaic perspective, you could even accept that uh, the descendants of Ishmael came to put the Jews back on to the path. And uh, But to say, you know, there have always been sages, there's always been a clear path of Judaism, of people who've done their best to submit to God, to serve God, to love God, to be within the bounds of the law. And, you know, the Jewish supremacy, like God forbid racism or mistreating, Judaism has a special role for the Jewish people in a belief that the world is progressing. You know, what Daniel's, uh, you know, we could talk about eschatology in the end of days, uh, but yes, eventually a prophet will come that will uh, unify the whole world in service of uh, God and it will be revealed to Jews, even to you know, relatively uh, rank and file Jews that don't understand Judaism that well, hopefully played a largely positive role in that. But like I said, God gives people free will and the Jewish people have uh, the ability to fall off the path and uh, are given time to repent. And God forbid, should we not, uh, you know, we will be uh, punished for that. However, you say that generally Jews are a force for good. There's guidelines within Judaism that keep these you know, basic tenets of the ritual, Sabbath, the holidays, moral and ethical practice. Uh, Judaism has a large focus on uh, business law, dealings in business. And uh, Judaism does postulate, I don't know if Islam has, if Daniel will address that, uh, a dualistic system where there's a difference between how Jews treat fellow Jews, uh, but it does not mean that Jews can you know, go wild and uh, mistreat uh, not Gentiles, although there are statements that we could address uh, that might indicate that. But no, Judaism has strict laws of how Jews must interact with everybody, and that also has to be within moral and ethical standards. You got it. And thanks for hanging in there with us, folks, as we've had a little bit of buffering, but looks like we made it through and didn't lose the connection. So we're going to kick it over to Daniel for his five-minute rebuttal. Then we're going to have open dialogue, folks, followed by Q&A. So get those questions in as quick as you can. With that, thanks very much, Daniel. The floor is all yours. Well, I don't believe in the pro idea of progress and progressivism. I don't think that the world is better today than it was in the past. I think things are getting worse, actually. Um, and it'd be interested to get David's perspective on Jewish eschatology, because, you know, things are supposed to be getting worse and worse um, as we get closer to the end of time, according to Islamic eschatology. Um, this is like a moral decay of, of humanity, and that's what ultimately ushers the end of days. Um, and that's when the Messiah comes um, to uh, basically save the world. So that's the idea of progress. I don't accept. I also don't accept that the values that people have today 
in terms of, you know, the so-called human rights, so-called freedom and equality, you know, what is claimed to be freedom and equality. I don't believe those are superior um, to what has been sent uh, by God's messengers, culminating in the final messenger of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, the thing about Muslims like keeping uh, Jews in check, um, that's a very charitable understanding of Muslims. I think that it's, uh, you know, it's not in line with what I've read in the Talmud and other texts of Jewish eschatology that ultimately Muslims are going to be crushed in terms of their religion by the Messiah. The Messiah is not going to permit other religions. Other Gentiles will either become Jews or they'll follow the Noahide laws. They're not allowed to continue practicing Islam. And of course, the idolaters uh, will be given a choice, uh, like Christians, to either leave their idolatry and become Jews or they'll be killed. Um, so that's my understanding of Jewish eschatology. Now, I think that what everyone's wondering is like, well, why not accept Islam? Like, why not accept Islam when you see it as, you know, having this kind of positive role? You have, you know, these similar beliefs. It seems like the obvious choice, especially someone who is, you know, is, is or aspires to be monotheistic. So that's, you know, the ultimate question that, you know, I think I'm left with uh, sitting across from Mr. David. My audience really wants to know um, what you think about that coming to Islam and what is really, you know, because when you talk about like this in group, out group, um, we can talk about the details of that. I didn't really focus on that in the opening statement other than the point about racism, um, the anti-black racism, anti-Arab racism. I want to know if you think that Jews are actually a divine people, like are they actually divine um, as the as we read in Deuteronomy, as we read in the works of many rabbis and the sages over time, um, are Jews this divine race? I think that's a really central question. As for in-group preference, every people, every group, every religion has an in-group preference of some kind. It might be very minimized in favor of universalism. I think that Judaism just is too far on ter in terms of in-group preference and particularism. I think liberalism, like modern liberalism, is too far on the universalist end. And I think Islam has a proper balance. There is a um, in-group preference in Islam. We do have to have this concept of al-wala, al-wala wal-bara. This is an important concept in Islam. You do have a preference for Muslims, um, but it's balanced. We still have to be just. We have to treat non-Muslims with justice. We have to treat them with honesty. If the, a Muslim and a non-Muslim go in front of a judge, the judge cannot uh, try to find a way to make the Muslim win the case. You know, this is not something found in Islam, but it is found within the Talmud. It is found in the Talmud, uh, certain principles and rules. Like if, you know, uh, a, a Gentile is ill and faces an emergency, uh, you are not allowed as a Jew to violate the Sabbath in order to help that uh, Gentile. In Islam, you know, if, for example, you had to, I don't know, drink alcohol to save a non-Muslim's life, uh, maybe it's your wife, like maybe your wife as a Muslim is a Jewish woman and you have to do something strange like drink alcohol in order to save the life of your of a non-Muslim Jew. Uh, you should do that. You should actually violate Islamic law in order to save uh, the Jewish person. So that that's a kind of balanced position between uh, particularism and in-group preference versus just absolute universalism. We're all the same no matter what you believe, no matter your background, etc. So. Um, yeah, that's the kind of critique that I would make of Judaism on, on that issue. But yeah, I'm just interested to hear more of your thoughts, David, and uh, converse with you in the open dialogue. You've got it. With that, we're going to jump into the open dialogue indeed. Folks, thanks so much for your questions. I've gotten them in the live chat. Keep them coming. And with that, we're going to kick it into the open dialogue, followed by five-minute closings and then the Q&A. Gentlemen, the floor is all yours. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I appreciate your uh, critique and criticism. You know, from a higher level, uh, your criticism should make us a better, a better people. And just you know, quickly say why I'm not Muslim, why I don't plan on converting to Islam, is because I see that um, Islam necessitates the truth of Judaism. It's just, it it uh, uh, necessitates the Hebrew prophets, although they might say that it's been corrupted. 
uh, from a Judeo perspective, it's okay, maybe we've fallen out the path. And, you know, you as a, you know, a, so to say, Ishmaelite could, uh, you know, a follower of Abraham could help us get back on the path or, you know, maybe the end of days, we all serve some useful purpose towards humanity. Um, but the actual, is Muhammad coming to bring anything new that was not already brought by the prophets uh, of Judaism? And can you have Islam true without Judaism being true, as I believe Judaism could be true independent of Islam? But Judaism, you consider the Talmud part of Judaism, you consider the Torah part of Judaism, you consider like the Midrash part of Judaism, or the Zohar, for example, and Kabbalah, those are part of Judaism, correct? Yeah, I mean, from a... Because Islam majority, doesn't, doesn't validate all of that. Well, yeah, so if you're saying as a Muslim, you reject the concept that they're sages of the generation, and so to say the prophecy, the mantle, is handed down generation to generation, and the uh, your representatives of the prophets are the sages of the Jews of the present day. So to say, as a Muslim, you would fundamentally reject that premise. Yeah, because it's been corrupted. The sages that you're referring to have corrupted the religion of Judaism. I mean, the, or the, I shouldn't say the religion of Judaism. The sages are Judaism, like that's rabbinic Judaism, but the revelation given to the prophets is something else. It's something completely different. Well, I mean, there's not Islam validates Islam validates the message of the prophets, the message, the the covenant, like the covenant that Muslims understand. The covenant with God is to only worship God and reject all gods and say there is no other God except God. That's the covenant. And that covenant is broken when you go and you worship God or you uh, other gods or you uh, make sacrifices to demons or you say that God has a penis and or like this whole idea of tikkun olam, like uh, God is disordered and that we have to bring order to God by doing mitzvot. Like those kinds of ideas are so far from monotheism. So from like a Muslim would be shocked to hear the idea that, oh, Islam confirms Judaism, unless that unless that Muslim has no idea what Judaism actually teaches. Well, it confirms the Hebrew prophets. So, I mean, my understanding also Islam operates similar that uh, you'll say Jews don't follow the prophets or the Talmud. We follow the sages, the generation and the sages of the sages because they're great scholars and they've read the important literature of every generation to make decisions on how this generation should act uh, with reality. And we could also go back to your point of progress because I, I most, uh, you know, the sages do agree that there's a certain regression. We're farther from God. We're further from the reg uh, uh, from the revelation, from prophecy. In many aspects, there's uh, been a devolution, not an evolution. But in many aspects, uh, there has been progress. Uh, it was like uh, ancient slavery or the harsh conditions, uh, technology. Uh, not necessarily the le the. Um, some might also say the legal system have uh, you know been adaptions like mosaic or the the law that it's changed. Uh, to the better. I'm not sure if you would fully uh, reject that or, or are you saying that Islam, you say you follow the Quran. It's like, no, you follow the sages of your generation that through their scholarship have interpreted the Quran, the Hadith uh, from generation to generation and how to deal with the problems facing uh, the people currently. Well, that's true. Like the um, Quran itself uh, and the hadith and the law, it's been transmitted through the ulama, the scholars, like the analog of what you call sages or rabbis. Uh, but there's, there's very significant differences. There's very significant differences. One, you know, outside of that system of transmission, like Islamic transmission through the, through the sages or the ulama, there is an independent verification that what is, what is being transmitted has been accurately and faithfully transmitted to our time. And I refer to like the Birmingham manuscript and the car radiocarbon dating of, of these, uh, you know, these manuscripts in the, from the Arabian Peninsula. So that's one difference. The other difference is that the um, what I mentioned in the presentation of the Avan Achnai and the authority of rabbis in Islam, the ulama they don't have an authority above God. They are beholden to the word of God. Whatever God and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, have said, they're beholden to that. So they can't have their own interpretation. Like we have no concept of gematria. We don't have a concept of any kind of like typological or symbolic 
uh, interpretation of the text. The ulama, they interpret the text according to language. So when God says, you know, don't go, don't approach unlawful intercourse, la taqrabu zina, don't approach fornication, they can't just interpret that according to some subjective understanding of what the words mean. They have to say, okay, well, this word, according to the context of the Arabs of at the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, and the first and second and third rightly guided generation, uh, they their interpretation is authoritative. Their understanding of the words and the language is authoritative. And we are just conveying that. We're just transmitting that. We don't have any authority beyond our ability to act accurately convey. Uh, so that's a very big difference with Judaism. In Judaism, the sages, they, are, they believe that they've, they can give positive commandments like takanot or gezarot, like negative commandments. They, they have the right to do that above and beyond what has come of the law to Moses. So that's a very big difference between Islam and Judaism. And it's, it, it makes a big difference because if you, don't, if you have the authority as a rabbi to just uh, you know, make these kinds of laws or I think to that's interpret. A misunderstanding. Okay, the please correct me. That, uh, I mean, they can't make new laws. They interpret the law under certain occasions. So, you know, God forbid, you know, any nice yeshiva Jewish boy knows the big three where Judaism requires person to lay down their life. If it's, you know, die or commit adult, uh, adultery, forbidden sexual relations, uh, die or commit idolatry. Or, or die or murder somebody else, that a Jew should lay down their life in that uh, manner than opposed to committing that sin. Other than that, Judaism is a religion to live by. And also, there, with the, you know, besides for the big three, there's also exceptions for Jewish law. Judaism wants success, wants Jews to be successful, and that's why Judaism takes different flavors in different nations. So the power of the rabbis is not to abrogate any laws in certain circumstances, like I mean, even you interpret you know, like modern Zionism uh, for these uh, military means or living as a minority in other nations, that there will be an understanding that this is how we should practice. And the sages, to some respect, they're just the best of us. That uh, you know, the, the best of the Jews that take Judaism seriously and study hard, and uh, you know, love and fear God, do their best to interpret and not to say we're not divine. Uh, Judaism, like all, we're all flesh and blood, we all die. Uh, there is a soul aspect that most of the sages do believe that Jews have a separate part of the soul that, uh, you know, if you want to say higher or has a higher function than uh, non Jews, it is a fundamental tenet. Actually, Maimonides is one of the only sages that doesn't hold that Jews have a fundamentally different soul than, uh, than non Jews, but it's, uh, the soul is divine. And to some extent, the soul isn't us, the soul is God's possession. Uh, the soul uh, and uh, you, there's also a larger responsibility of punishment. Do Gentiles have? Do Gentiles have divine souls? I mean, most of, everything has a divine soul, like some form of panpsychism. All man has the image of God. In uh, you know Genesis, very clearly, uh, man, all man is created in the image of God, and that creates a fundamental basis for universal human rights. Well, and are are Gentiles men? All men. I mean the the. The Bible uses the word man to refer to all man. The, the expression, uh, no man's blood is redder than the, and another, actually comes from the Talmud and the question why we're all descended uh, from Adam and the basis for universal human rights. But to say the soul, a certain quality of the soul, that there is some special, uh, so additional soul that are in Jewish people. So the, that uh, that is a fundamental tenet of Judaism, that there is a special status and role of the Jewish people. So is there an additional part within the Jewish soul that's divine, that's extra, that not that Gentiles don't have? The Kabbalists, so these are belief systems that are not fundamental. So we say, you know, Judaism, God gave us the law, we have to submit, there's reward and punishment. Then certain sages and scholars posited these religious systems, um, you know, how they're accepted to have, uh, you know, so to say, known the mind of God. Uh, there's certain fundamental texts of various sages that are accepted to have known these details and you know generally there's an animal soul that resides in all animals in the blood of all animals and then there's a soul that all humans have with the power of speech as uh, the expression in genesis that god breathed uh the soul into man and then there's a third higher level soul that's unique to jewish people 
and that's unique to uh, you know, the eschatology, so to say, it, you know, as Philo described, the demiurge of some form of, of special role of progress being pushed forward through the Jewish people. Hmm. Yeah, so there is a, a, a different level that is divine that is exclusive to Jews. And this is the statements of many rabbis, so I just want to it's see if you accept It's a fundamental planet of Judaism. Yeah, I'm going to say, like, almost every, all the sages, besides Maimonides, uh, who is uh, you know, one of the few people largely influenced by Islam that don't say that, but it's you know, over 90% of the sages hold that there's a unique special soul of the Jews that uh, non-Jews don't have. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that the rabbis can't really change the law or can, let me ask you this, can rabbis introduce prayers, like new prayers? Um, well, and make it like a requirement. Well, yeah, I mean, historically, there's a canonization process. The prayers that Jews currently say in synagogue was canonized, some going back to the Second Temple period. In fact, uh, many of the prayers that are in the prayer book uh, only go back a few hundred years and were canonized, uh, you know, in spot by Rabbi Yosef Karo and a few of the sages. There's a method of canonization. But to say that's, you know, to, to say a prayer is a fundamental law uh, that, that can't be changed or added to say that you should say this prayer um, in Judaism, the law, there's uh, laws of the Torah and there's laws of the rabbis and the laws of the Torah always have more principle than the laws of the rabbi. And there's also ritual. So in best case, you should do rituals uh, um, and then laws of the rabbi and then laws of the Torah. And depending on the circumstance, uh, you could uh, the, the laws of the uh, rituals then laws of the rabbi are less stringent and the laws of the Torah, besides for the big three, uh, also uh, tend to have exceptions. Well, don't you see how this creates a problem? Because if the rabbis can introduce new laws and they can also cancel out certain things, like can they cancel out polygamy? Can they cancel out like Lexus talionis, like eye for an eye? The fact that the rabbis can add and they can subtract, the question becomes, well, what if the rabbis are influenced negatively by political powers or they're influenced by their environment or they get influenced by some pagan religion, um, then this could be a disaster because what you think is Judaism and your religion is going to be end up just resembling whatever culture or context it finds itself in. That isn't, don't you think that that's a big problem? Well, if it's how God created the system, God gave us free will and you know the sages are just the best of us and are doing uh, you know the best of the generation so that uh, the sages do the best to guide us on the path of God. People believe in your know, providence that God is there to try to guide us in the right direction, but it's a fundamental tenet that we have free will and uh, man has the ability to go off the path, but there is a fundamental reward and punishment. If we go too far off the path, you know, God will use punishment uh, to draw us back in. Well, then what's the, sure, what's the point sure of having a Torah? As a Muslim, if you disagree with this, fundamental, you know, tenet of free will, and even the sages, uh, you know, that are just the best of us and only have limited ability to cope with free will? No, no, we, people have free will, but ultimately you have to submit to God. And submitting to God means that there has to be something that objectively God has said and you're submitting to it. So God says, do not do unlawful sexual intercourse, do not drink or alcohol, or let's say, you know, don't, don't uh, commit incest or don't uh, eat pork. God is giving you those commandments and then you submit to those commandments. But if you say, oh, we all have free will to just, and the sages do as well, and they say that, well, pork is now lawful or, oh, now, you know, Lexus talionis, eye for an eye is no longer applicable. And by the way, you have to do this prayer that is not was not done by Moses or any prophets, but we through our sageness have decided that's not submission. That's like making it up as you go. Yeah, but I'm saying uh, just like Islam, fear of God is a fundamental tenet. One of the clear signs of a sage is fear of God, a person who has extreme fear of sinning, of uh, not doing the right thing. And the, the people that rise to uh, guide humanity, but uh, you're relatively uh, you know, like King Solomon, the glory of the king is in the masses, and um, the sages also have to preserve the tradition uh, to uh, the best of the ability, but they also have to guide the masses to the best of their ability, and through that there could be 
uh, laws, there could be uh, leniencies or strictness in terms like polygamy. Uh, polygamy was banned in Europe. Uh, you know, when Israel was created, uh, many, you know, Morocco, Tunisia, Israel uh, outlawed uh, polygamy, but there was polygamy still practiced even today in some, uh, you know, I think uh, Tunisia, maybe even Yemen, uh, that, that uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, the sages have a certain power. The sages can't abrogate, uh, the sages could add restrictions, you know, called fences and gates uh, in order to keep the people on the straight and narrow path. Uh, but, uh, you know, fear of God and uh, love of God, uh, you know, people have to come onto that themselves. And uh, you know, so I'm not exactly sure what you're getting at. And if there is a fundamental difference in Islam in how you have sages, uh, you know, guiding uh, people that have a tendency to go astray. Yeah, I mean, we do it like uh, this is a big this is a big issue with every religion. Uh, every religion will uh, have this external force that will try to change that religion. And we read this in the Bible. We, we read in the Quran. Uh, people hate God. There are some people who hate, hate God. There are satanic forces. They want to change the religion and they want to change you and take you off of the straight path. Um, so w when that force is being exerted on people, then um, many weak people, they might be intelligent, they might be wise, but they're still influenced by that. They, they can be influenced by that. I'll give you an example. Within the Muslim community, unfortunately, we have what I call compassionate imams. Okay, These are imams who are so apologetic that they start distorting uh, and speaking contrary to the Quran, contrary to the Sunnah. So they are distorting because of a political pressure. They are liberalizing the faith. They are liberalizing Islam. But what Muslims have at our disposal that Jews do not have at their disposal is that Muslims can say that, oh, hey, you liberal imam, what you're saying contradicts what the Quran says in this chapter, in this verse. It contradicts the hadith, this hadith preserved in this book. And what, so therefore you are wrong. You are distorting the religion and we reject you. We, we reject your preaching. That's something that Muslims uh, can do because we've preserved. We have authentic texts uh, and it's very. Do. Well, so, I mean, you, the, you could try to do and say so you have sages that might try to reign in the masses or to get rid of. I mean, generally, like rabbis. Well, that, that's fine. Like they 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 have the free will like those imams. They have the free will. If they want to go astray, they want to be misguided. Uh, that's their choice that God will judge them for that. But the important thing is that the religion is preserved. There's an objective religion that people can follow and can say that, okay, we followed the book of Allah, the book of God and his messenger, and we didn't fall for this trap. We didn't fall for this deviation or this misguidance. Because if you don't have that objective text that's preserved, then that generation, like that uh, imam who's introducing these distortions, uh, people won't know, is, is he actually introducing distortions or is he genuine? He's genuinely representing Islam. Like, for example, he says Islam is all about women's rights and Islam is all about like giving women, you know, this and that. Or Islam is all about, uh, you know, liberal uh, democracy. He's introducing that and people, if they don't have a reference to go back to and say, well, I'm not reading any democracy in the Quran. So what are you talking about? then people will fall for that and they'll say, okay, yeah, I guess Islam is liberal democracy. And then the next generation after that is going to be even more misguided. The next generation will be more misguided. And that's how the whole religion becomes corrupted. And then God has to basically send another messenger, another revelation. And that's, that's exactly what I'm saying is happened to Judaism. And it seems like you're affirming that. You're affirming that, yeah, the rabbis do have this kind of authority, but they're the sages, they're trying their best and they have free will. I, I don't understand the the coherence of that. Well, so from a Judaic pers uh, rabbinic perspective, God is active in the world. Like the world's not on cruise control. God is active in guiding the world, in managing things, including giving us free will, and uh, testing us, allowing us to have reward and punishment. And this is the method. Like I mentioned, there's the God's eye perspective. Truth is not knowable to man. We just have to submit and try our best. We follow the sages who have gotten closest to truth within the potential of uh, mankind. But truth is only known from God and how God intercedes and tries to keep us on course is God's business. So you know, the sages are just the best of us. So if you've risen up, you know, you took your studies seriously and you fear and love God and you're worried about the state of humanity and you're trying to guide humanity back to the right 
uh, place, including Jews, you know, God bless you. Um, you know, you should be rewarded and commended for that. Uh, but it's a difficult task. And, uh, you know, obviously it's not so simple to just be like, you know, to yell at people and be like, you, you know, you're doing wrong. You got to get back on the path. And, uh, you know, so you pray. Isn't that what Moses did? Then Moses yell at the Israelites after they yeah, were delivered. It didn't work that well. I mean, saying with the <laughs> Jews are stiff necked people uh, that, uh, you know, stubborn tendency to uh, reject authority, you know, let alone uh, all people. So, you know, saying that, uh, I mean, my understanding, of this, the method well, of the stages. That's why they were punished. <laughs> Well, I'm saying the method of the sages and uh, uh, law is very similar between Islam and traditional Judaism. And, uh, you know, if you're just kind of straw manning to say like, oh, the rabbis are like gods or the rabbis have the ability to change the law. Well, the rabbis are just the greatest of the generation who fear and love God, who have uh, studied, dedicated their whole life to it, rejected, uh, you know, uh, material pleasures for the sake of uh, the masses and do their best to guide humanity. But each individual has... Uh, free will. I mean, I don't even have to. Uh, um, uh, I can steel man your position and say that yeah, all the sages were good. All the sages were amazing, uh, good the people. Best of us. They're not the perfect. best. They're the best of us. Okay, they're, they're the best, and they have you know all kinds of wisdom. I'll steel man your position. I won't even uh, attribute to them uh, evil or corruption. Let's say that they were just doing their best with the best intentions, in in the exact same way as like a game of telephone. Like when you play a game of telephone and one person set whispers to the next, whispers to the next, the message gets distorted, even when you have the best intentions. Like that's just a function of human communication. Like that, this is why you have to have a, per, uh, a preserved benchmark to go back to, um, because even in the best of sin well, scenarios, what about God? That, I mean, God, it's, the world's not on cruise control. There is a God that. Uh, you but know, it, where's the revelation that he's sending? What is the revelation that's being sent? Well, I'm saying God is not sending more prophets to tell the final Messiah, uh, but uh, you know God interacts with humanity in a way that is beyond our comprehension. So, yeah, that's difficult for me to understand. You don't think God's interacting or even you know the same? Oh yeah, God, I'm not a deist. Pray, I'm not a deist. More. But I mean, essentially, how God interacts or steers humanity in the right direction is beyond the comprehension even of the sages. Well, do you you're saying that a lot of Orthodox Jews don't believe in God? What percentage of Orthodox Jews do you think don't even believe in God? Well, because belief is just one of the laws. That like practice is more fundamental, and like I mentioned, hypocrisy. Judaism accepts hypocrisy as natural. Belief waxes and wanes. So you could go through periods of your life where you believe strongly, and periods of your life where you don't believe. And if you go through periods of life where your belief is waning, you could try to increase your belief. But the main thing is behavior. And, uh, you know, so I'm not sure. I mean, my understanding of Islam, you know, even says hypocrisy is the trait of the Jew. But I would say Judaism takes a practical uh, view of that. A belief is a commandment. But if you don't believe, it's just one commandment. And uh, there's still the law. And, uh, you know, just because you don't believe doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you could dump everything else. And it's considered honorable to follow the law even if you don't believe how can you follow the law if you don't if you don't believe in god well it's simple he's saying um you know like i don't feel like i believe today uh you know so i'm gonna go pray i mean it's dennis prager's famous statement when he was a kid and you know he told his rabbi i don't want to pray today and he said well so what go pray and and saying that well uh, okay i don't believe in god today i still went through the motions and said the prayers and uh, you know did my rituals and if it's moral ethical behavior and, you know, that, you know, Islam calls that hypocrisy. Judaism says that's honorable. You say, if you don't believe today, you didn't pray. Or if you don't feel that you didn't believe strongly in the morning, you still prayed. I don't, I don't, can't really relate to that experience. Obviously, the level of, like, well, your feeling of closeness, your feeling of closeness to God uh, can wax and wane. Uh, that's acknowledged in Islam. Um, and the Prophet Islam explicitly mentions it. But like to just wake up one day and say, I don't believe in God. <laughs> and then the next day you believe in God. Like, I don't know. That phenomenology doesn't really make sense to me. Like if you don't believe in God, but you're just going through life praying and fasting and giving charity, then yeah, you're, you're a hypocrite because your actions have no value. You, there's no uh, faith. To, like the, the core of the religion is faith. 
uh, and the rest of it are branches of faith. So like even removing a... The core of Islam like a, is faith. The core of Judaism is adherence to the law, not faith. Yeah, I have a trouble understanding that, but I accept well, I mean, that it's a fundamental your, difference what you're describing. To me. That uh, your Judaism is, uh, belief is just one of the commandments. And, you know, and, and actually to some extent, uh, the commandments of how you treat your fellow man are ritualistic, to some extent are considered more important uh, than uh, belief. And, so could uh, you like, could you go through, like go through rituals, orthodox rituals and believe in Satan? Like, like believe that Satan is actually, you know, who you, who you're dedicating your worship to. You're doing all of the law, all of the rituals exactly according to what the sages have taught. But in your heart, you're thinking, uh, this is for Satan. It's a sin of the mind. So say, God, when we stand judgment, God will judge us, including all our desires of our, of our heart and thoughts. Uh, but the key thing is action in saying from the legal system, we don't judge people on belief. We only judge them on action and to some extent uh, speech. So yes, it's a sin of the mind. Idolatry, you know, there's actually making an idol, bowing an I to an idol, serving an idol, and then there's idolatry of the mind. And that's also sinful, but it's, you know, so to say, one sin. And it's not fundamental. So you know, it's like, oh, you broke this one, the most important of all sins. Uh, Judaism doesn't necessarily have these fundamental, this law is more important than the other laws of belief. And, uh, uh, you know, so to say, duties of the heart and mind are just one aspect of the law. Can you just give me an estimate, like percentage wise, what percentage of Orthodox Jews are atheists? Um, we have to ask individually. I would say even estimate. half. Even half. And half? I would say, yeah, I would say even half. Uh, Orthodox, not just but even Jewry Orthodox, in Let me say atheist is a strong word. Agnostic or go through periods of time. And like, yeah, I, I had my friends and, and we prayed and we talked about this all the time. And, uh, you know, even... Uh, you know, you could have a guy that, uh, you know, like, I stopped doing the afternoon prayer. You know, like, okay, Islam has five prayers a day. Judaism has three. And it's like, I'm not feeling it. And they just cut out the afternoon prayer because, you know, maybe their family or other people, they, they you know, that would notice. So they still do the morning and, and night prayer because they don't want everybody to know that they're having doubt. Uh, but, you know, with their friends and uh, you know, the, the books talk about that. So the greatest text uh, in faith is extremely important. So a person who fears and loves God you have to work on faith, uh, and there is a connection between faith and action. But uh, your know, Judaism, one thing as an expression, within doing the action for the wrong reason, you come to do it uh, for the right reason. So you say, well, I don't care what you believe, just uh, do the right thing. And I'm, I'm you're saying from a Muslim perspective, that's not the case, that you'd be like, well, you no longer believe anymore, you're out, I don't care what you do anymore. It's like, no, I mean, whether you believe uh -huh. or not, you still have to follow the rules. Yeah, in Islam, we do have the concept of following the rules, um, but it's like there's a value for society and for your family when people follow the rules. That's like an, an ordered society. That's what the Sharia law is about, is to order society. And the expression that Muslims have or the belief that Muslims have is that a healthy Islamic society will have a lot of hypocrites. A healthy Islamic society will have a lot of hypocrites. Hypocrite, being a hypocrite is the worst thing. Like a hip, munafiq is the term. It doesn't. It's not exactly translated into English properly. Like a hypocrite means has different connotations. But like a munafiq is someone who externally is like a Muslim and says all the right things that yes, I'm a Muslim. But internally, he doesn't believe. He doesn't believe in God. So a healthy Islamic society will have many of such people. Why? Because that means the public domain is preserved. Like there is an expectation publicly that we're following what God wants. We're following the commands of God as a society because the Sharia and Islam is not just about personal private belief. It's also about the community, about society also following God's plan and God, God's commandments. Uh, so if you have that kind of healthy Islamic society, then yes, there's going to be hypocrites and uh, munafiqeen. Um, that's their personal problem. Publicly, they're following the rules, but privately, they disbelieve. They're going to face the consequences of that, severe consequences. Uh, but that doesn't 
you know, that's completely coherent and consistent. Like that's what you'd expect. But what you're saying is, is, is different from this. Well, let me you're take saying a that level, he, a person can be a hypocrite and that's still acceptable. Like that's still well, something like, with, is level. God pleased with someone who is following the law? God is, is God pleased with someone who's following all of the Jewish law, but he just doesn't believe. He doesn't like really actually believe in God. Does God, is God pleased by that? Well, I mean, to the fullest level from the metaphysics, the psychology of the soul, uh, the Talmud, the Kabbalist, man has an evil inclination. Most say Jews and non-Jews, all people. Uh, the Talmud says, I had a rabbi from Afghanistan, and we used to quote this to each other when we felt weak. It never takes a vacation. Every time you beat it, it comes back stronger. There's an evil inclination that is mostly in the mind that constantly tells us to, uh, misleads us. And it's a constant battle that till death, uh, we will struggle. There's no way to uh, fully beat the evil inclination. It's always with us. It always comes back every time we beat it. And it, it's a you know doubt, and it starts in the mind, and it uh, leads to speech, which leads to action. And so, your know, belief is very important because you have uh, you know doubt in the mind uh, leads to uh, uh, failure in action. Uh, but no, I mean very very clearly, the Judeo tradition uh, says that that is a constant of life. You're always going to have a voice in your head that is pushing us in the wrong direction, that uh, you know, evil in general, God created evil for a purpose. Evil is a tool of God to test us and to be able to give us a reward. It is always with us. Uh, you know, Till death, we will always have this inclination that is constantly testing us. And I, I don't know if Islam uh, you know, disagrees or if, I wouldn't be surprised if you agree with that. Yeah, there is an inclination. There is like um, the whispers of Satan, for example, or even a person can have like certain lusts or an ego, uh, what's called the nefs, uh, uh, which can, or can uh, have or saying like, no, you're going to have that. From you're going to have that. Yeah, you're going to you have die, that. There's no way to get rid of it. Yeah, you're going to have that. And that's part of the struggle of life. It is a spiritual internal struggle. Uh, but if you give into it and you say, yeah, actually, I'm tired of believing in God. I, I think God is really needs to get out of my business. Then you have failed the test like you have basically fallen into the trap and you failed and God is not pleased with that. Like that is your free will to struggle against that in that uh, that tendency. But you are responsible and held accountable if you uh, if you're able to resist it. Um, God has given you the power to resist that, and if you don't, then you are um, you're going to be damned because of that. Well, it comes to the back to the hypocrisy test. So, let's say I struggle, my mind, I can't beat it. You know, like I'm I'm doubting. I have a lot of trouble. You know, look what's going on in Gaza. Look at uh, the world, and uh, you know, the Holocaust or evil, anti-Semitism. I just have so many doubts, and I can't fight it. Uh, but and then people dump it. So do you forget this God stuff? I'm an atheist and I'm just going to forget, uh, you know, trying to be a good person, morals and ethics and do whatever I want. So there's levels of failure to say, well, I have a lot of doubt, but uh, I still did the right thing. I still fought, even though I lost my mind, I was able to win in the realm of action. And that's still a success and say, OK, you might be a sin. You say it's a sin to lose in the realm of thought. Uh, but it's a greater sin to lose in the realm of action. So what the greatest sin is what? Well, it's saying it's a greater sin when it is carried out by the limbs. So say a person who desires adultery, that's a sin. A person who does adultery, that's a much more serious sin than just desiring adultery. But you're saying like disbelieving in God, like God doesn't exist or cursing God, like that's just a sin. And like, I want to understand, like, what is the level of sin there? So if he, someone is in, mentally cursing God, but is like doing the ritual, then, you know, or like, what about if he, you know, misses a ritual, but he you break it down disbelieves to thought, in God. Speech, and action. So Jewish law has details of thought, speech, and action in every detail. So there could be a sin of thought, a sin of speech, and a sin of action. They're all related that once you lose the battle of thought, it's likely to be carried out in speech and then in action. Uh, but, uh, you know, so if you just lost the battle of thought but didn't carry out action, you didn't do that sin. You know, so God forbid a person, um, you know, even to, you know, a person's, you know, thinking dirty thoughts uh, versus watching pornography versus actually uh, carrying out forbidden sexual activity. So they're all different degrations of just thinking dirty thoughts is sinful. And, you know, God uh, will punish and reward us according to our levels. But, uh, you know, certainly uh, when you take it to a further level, 
And if someone said like, you know, God forbid, I tried my hardest, but the last 20 years, I've been weak in my thoughts. And, uh, but I never took it to action. I mean, just, okay, you're a happily married man and say most people, okay, have you ever, God forbid, you know, desired, uh, had feelings in your mind versus that actually carried it out. So you know, if your, your wife going to say, have you ever once had an improper thought in the last, you know, since you've been married? And we're like, well, you know, probably, but you know, would I even yeah. consider carrying it out? Definitely not. Yeah, on, on I, I think level, we like have we faith. have a similar idea in Islam, but like thoughts are are actually you're held accountable for your thoughts and your inclinations. But um, like there's levels, so disbelieving in God, like that's a different level. But I mean, not to just dwell on this point too much. I want to ask you more about this whole idea of victim complex that you mentioned in your opening and how um, Mount Sinai is associated with hatred. And that God caused all Jews to be hated. Um, and the notion that Jews are undergoing genocides for no reason, um, as mentioned in the Talmud. Like, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Okay, well, God forbid. Uh, there's different understandings of the sages. But, you know, God is just um, an aspect of being the chosen people. So, like, Mount Sinai, when the Jewish people were chosen, it caused a force of hatred. And also to say the understanding of biblical prophecy and Islam and Judaism of the birthright that Abraham had, you know, two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and the birthright was given to Isaac and Islam is a sister religion, but there's adversarial relation and Islam has a natural grudge against Judaism because we have the birthright. And that also the case with Esau and Jacob that Esau becomes, uh, you know, Rome in the West and uh, the birthright goes to Jacob, and there's this natural grudge and hatred. And in biblical prophecy, at the end of days, um, this comes into like the king of the north or king of the south, east and west, that uh, the world will be under the dominion of half the world, you know, so to say the east uh, will be under the dominion of Ishmael, Islam, and the west will be under the dominion of Esau, of Christianity, and uh, you know, Armageddon, the great war of free will, that if all humanity repents and comes together, the you know the, the we could usher in the messianic era without bloodshed. Uh, but if humanity doesn't repent, there'll be a great war, which will basically be the between the forces of Ishmael and Esau, uh, the West and East. Uh, so you know this is a fundamental understanding of biblical prophecy. Uh, most Jews have a hard time you know with this, and you know so reject the fundamental tenet. You know so to say, uh, you know that God punishes the Jews more harshly. We, and uh, that uh, one of the tools that God uses to punish the Jews for going off track is anti-Semitism. Say, so, okay, Daniel, if you're rising up as a, a critic of the Jew, maybe some Jews would say as an enemy to the Jew, that the cause of that is the sins of the Jewish people. In the language of the prophets, you know, the Jewish people went astray, so God rose up, uh, you know, a man from another nation to uh, destroy the Jewish people. So, uh, you know, that's a fundamental tenet, uh, whether to say like Genesis, God is just. You know, there's reward and punishment. Um, you say if people are punished, it's generally because of bad behavior. People are rewarded. It's because of good behavior and anti-Semitism, um, you know, genocide, any of these factors is uh, you know, part of the method that God uses to reward and punish people, keep us on track. So what about these genocides that are mentioned in the Talmud? Um, like if you go to, you, you might have seen the my... You might have seen my presentation at Queens College, Tumit but um, the idea that like 64 million Jewish children were killed. Um, Those different numbers. But I'm going to say, yes, when the Romans, there's multiple times when the Babylonians de uh, destroyed Jerusalem, uh, you know, the Assyrians. Does, that, does Romans, that number make sense, though? Like 64 million? No, you I mean, think that's an exaggeration? There's different numbers in the, in, the Rab in, in the Talmud. If you say it's an exaggeration, the, the exact number is not necessarily important and even the talmud says that that was largely punishment for our sins not to not that it mm -hmm. condones the the you know, people that carried it out but uh, you know mankind uh, collectively falls off the path and then you know god will purge humanity through great wars and allow us to reset and get back on the path god forbid in the sense that evil is a tool that god uses largely for our own benefit you know suffering you know I'm, i believe islam's uh, muslims generally also agree with that even suffering is in essence a benevolent tool that God uh, gives us in order to 
uh, atonement for our sins or get back on the right path. No, but Muslims don't like have this idea that like you you said victim complex in your opening. Like Muslims don't have a victim complex. We don't have these kinds of exaggerated historical genocides. Um, like 64 million of Muslim children were killed by our en enemies. Like this concept of Amalek. Most of the sages um, don't have a victim complex. I mean, Jews might, and it's saying that you know Jews uh, reject, but most of the sages don't have a victim complex. And uh, you know, God forbid. You know, say God uh, is exact, and uh, you know these boom bust cycles of uh, rewarding you know, Jews do well, and in good times Jews disproportionately you know, have wealth and power, and in bad times, God forbid, uh, you know, Jews will uh, you know, face uh, you know, very dire consequences. God forbid, we should all repent immediately. Hmm. So, um, Amalek, like, so do you think that I don't know your views on Zionism? So maybe you can mention that. A lot of people I, are I lean curious. anti-Zionist um, as a heresy. Although, you know, it's a religious heresy, and I say Zionism is probably one of the more fundamental beliefs of Jews today. It's an unfortunate heresy why Jews fall into it. Uh, we, you know, I, we didn't talk about the Third Temple. I do believe, you know, the Third Temple that eventually, uh, many sages say, actually, like, God forbid, if Jews had the temple site right now, we would, uh, you know, blasphemy and turn into a theater. And that's why Muslims, well, I do believe that will eventually go back to the Jews. But uh, no, I don't think we need a Jewish state. I, I would personally favor giving all Gazans, Palestinians, full Israeli citizenship. There's nothing in Judaism that necessitate, necessitates ethno-nationalism. Um, but that's a minority opinion. Unfortunately, in, among the sages, it's mixed. Uh, you know, so an, you know, anti-Zionism of different levels of, uh, of the sages. And in the current state, unfortunately, even most of the current day sages are Zionist. I don't, but don't you think like this idea of anti-semitism being something inherent like to the gentile um that's like almost given by god and this idea of these genocides historically that are mentioned in the talmud or even in the uh, pentateuch like doesn't that lead to uh kind of this zionist aggression like and and zionist um atrocities um, creating atrocity propaganda like the idea that palestinians killed 40 babies uh, beheaded 40 babies engaged in like a mass sexual assault campaign like this these kinds of things are proven to be lies but they yes I mean, even they, i said yes god forbid that i'll give you a chance to respond david and then we have to go to the q and or before the q a five minute closings but david i want to give you a chance yeah i would say unfortunately yes god forbid uh you know, say so the jews have an important role to drive progress forward and if we fail in that task calamity you know collective karma sin comes to the world calamity will come and uh, you know god is just and if the jewish people are sinful god will punish the jewish people as we've seen in history that could be extremely strong and if uh, you know uh, if israel is mistreating the palestinians uh, you're doing these horrible things god is just god will defend the palestinians and punish the jewish people for our sins with that we'll jump into the five minute closings starting with david thanks very much david the floor is all yours Okay, yeah, I really appreciate this, James, uh, giving me the opportunity to defend uh, Judaism. And, uh, you know, Daniel, uh, um, I mentioned, you know, I think all of your questions are legitimate and deserve answers. And, you know, to Jews, uh, we should take this as incentive to take our Judaism, our scholarship uh, more seriously. If Daniel's bringing up quotes that we haven't studied in sages, in texts that we don't know how to answer, uh, you, we should study harder. And if Daniel's pointing out bad things that the Jewish people are doing, we should take uh, take the rebuke and try to uh, uh, correct our behavior. Um, I would say I'm not against Islam. You know, the traditional, you know, say if Moses, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, um, Christianity, you know, even atheism makes you a better person. The key thing is action, being a moral, ethical person. God judges people on their belief in internal things. Man shouldn't judge people on their beliefs, should judge people on their actions. So if... Uh, you know, if, even though Daniel gives strong criticism, you know, is he charitable? Does he treat uh, people uh, nicely uh, and judge him based on that? And, uh, you know, so I appreciate the, you know, the criticism and, you know, definitely in the state of the war, uh, Jews should be reflective about what we're doing and the world in general. We're at a scary place where uh, you could see, you know, God might uh, you know, purge humanity and have to restart. So, uh, but we, I believe in free will. And, uh, you know, collectively, we could uh, become better people. And I would say that's the main message of 
Judaism, the sages are simply the best of us. We should try to be be the best. And, you know, so like the being, why you? Uh, I'm just a person who took uh, my rabbi seriously, took my Jewish studies seriously. I want to be a good person. I try to love and fear God. And I would encourage everybody to do the same, be good to each other, take uh, scholarship seriously. Uh, this dialogue is extremely important in terms of the golden rule. Treat people the way they want to be treated. You have to do things like interfaith and understand people's uh, beliefs, uh, but also, you know, the non-harm principle that, uh, you know, people are harming other people, they need to be called out, and we need open dialogue, and, and God forbid, especially, you know, the world falling into war, the disaster happening in uh, in, in Gaza, you know, pray every day for uh, your know, peace, and collectively, humanity will make the right decision. You got it. Thank you very much. We'll kick it over to Daniel as well for his closing. So again, I want to thank David. It was a very nice dialogue. I think uh, it was very beneficial for the audience to really understand, like my audience to understand uh, some of the beliefs of Judaism and the differences between Judaism and Islam. Uh, I also want to say that, um, you know, it's good to have these kinds of conversations. Um, I don't believe in hating Jews. I, some of the best uh, people that I know are Jews. They're Muslims, who Jews who have converted to Islam. So they're Jewish Muslims. Um, Judaism is an ethnicity, which I think um, David mentioned. But um, also even amongst uh, non-Muslim Jews, you find those who have you know, some of these good principles and are honest. And I think David really exemplified that. So I appreciated it. My audience appreciated it. Everyone's saying, oh, David is such a nice guy. So thank you again, David, for that. Um, as for the presentation and my conclusion, again, the, the issue with Judaism is that it doesn't have authentic texts. It doesn't have this tradition of preservation. We see so many distortions that were introduced by whether the sages, the rabbis, or different Jewish people throughout the centuries. And this has created uh, a uh, paper trail, basically, of polytheism, of the anthropomorphism, describing God as if he is, uh, he looks like a rabbi, or he has a penis, or all of these kinds of things that any Muslim or any monotheist would find actually quite blasphemous, these kinds of corporeal de descriptions that border on the lewd. Um, and then also demon worship, uh, racism, uh, magic, uh, amulets, all these things. These are this is the paper trail of polytheism and the influence of outside cultures, which has corrupted Judaism. It has it corrupted what was a pristine message and the Torah, the Torah which was sent by God to Moses, um, the holy Torah that Muslims believe in. That was corrupted, and the the Torah that now we see. Um, that cannot be, it, it logically cannot be the Torah that was given to Moses. Why? Because uh, we, there are so many versions of the Torah, uh, and some of them are dating back to what Jews today officially consider the Hebrew Bible, namely the Masoretic text. You find the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there are very significant um, variations between the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, the Masoretic text, uh, the Targum, etc., so those kinds of variations have theological implications. You know, when the Dead Sea Scrolls say Bene Elohim, the sons of God, but the Manor Masoretic text, uh, which comes later, changes Bene Elohim and says sons of Israel, Bene Israel, then that's, that's a very significant change. Does God have sons or not? Does God have a wife or not? Like, does God, you know, have uh, a divine king as a son? Like these kinds of questions that we read or, or issues that we see in the Psalms and, and the Pentateuch as well. So this, these are, this is the paper trail of corruption and it, it's, it begs for correction. It begs for, okay, what is the real message of Moses? What is the real religion that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai? And, and what are the real beliefs that we should hold? And that's where Islam comes in. That's where the revelation, that's where the Quran comes in. That's where the final messenger comes to confirm what has come before, the correct things that came before, and to reject and to correct the mistakes, the corruptions that have been introduced, the polytheism, the anthropomorphism, the demon worship that has been introduced. That is why uh, Jews need Islam. 
Jews need Islam. And I don't say this as an arrogant person to say, oh, we have the truth. The truth is with God and it is up to all of us to submit to the truth that God has revealed. And so I humbly, with humbleness, uh, invite Jews uh, and invite the world to uh, investigate Islam, uh, research the claims that I have made in this presentation, think rationally, ponder, reflect uh, on, on the claims that I'm making and that the Quran makes, read the Quran, learn about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, see you know how the Prophet Muhammad is a prophet in the long lines of, of prophets that uh, Jews also believe in. Go and do that, and I, and I believe that the uh, sincere person will be led to the straight path. So uh, thank you again very much for that, and uh, I look forward to any questions that come in the Q&A. Thank you very much for those closings, gentlemen. We're going to jump into the Q&A, folks. We want to say a couple of things. First, if you did not know, our guests are linked in the description. If you'd like to hear more, you can hear more by clicking on their links below. And that includes at the podcast where we put our guest links there as well. Also, if you didn't know, we do have a podcast. Check it out. You can listen to debates all the time, even if you don't have service. Anywhere you are, you can download them right to your phone. Find Modern Day Debate on your favorite podcast app right now to listen to debates on the go. This first question coming in from, do appreciate it. We've got a pretty good amount here. So we're going to try to go quickly through these. I, Judas Fly, says, Hail Duvid. I think you have a fan out there, Duvid. This one's Sarfaraz and Sari says, for Daniel, apostasy is considered as treason in Islamic State. What if a Jewish nation also executes a now Muslim slash Christian for leaving Judaism? Is that also justified for safety of Jewish people? Just, Judas is a friend of mine, and if, if you're Iranian, he's half Jewish from his mother, half Jewish, uh, you know, half Iranian, non-Jewish, half Iranian Jewish uh, living in California. Thank you. Yeah, so... I mean, this is a silly question. Uh, let me give you an analogy. Like, um, if a country, uh, you know, has jurisdiction, uh, should it have police and should police have guns to enforce the law and be this kind of executive power? So if you lived in a Jewish state, Daniel, would you accept the police of that Jewish state and the executive, the, like the judiciary and the executive branch, Daniel? Would you respect that? And the answer is, yes, I can respect the judiciary. That doesn't mean I respect necessarily the basis of the law, you know, the ideological or religious basis of the law. But if I happen to live in a Jewish state and that was the law, then I have no choice but to respect the law. Um, in the same way in Islam, we have the apostasy punishment. Um, if someone leaves Islam, um, they don't have to commit treason. They just leave Islam. Then that comes with the death penalty as well in Islamic law. So I don't agree, I don't disagree with any group, you know, the, the principle of uh, there is a punishment for defection, you a punishment for leaving the group, whether it's you're leaving Judaism, you're leaving, uh, you know, America, uh, you're leaving like liberalism, you're leaving Hinduism, like the idea that there would be a punishment for defection. OK, that exists. My disagreement is with Judaism and the truth claims of Judaism. I disagree with those or Hinduism or liberalism. Do you see the distinction that I'm making? It's, it's um, you know, th so this is not a good critique. This is not a good critique against the apostasy punishment in Islam and saying, oh, if you were, if you're a Muslim under a Jewish state, you wouldn't want to be executed. It, it's, th that's an incoherent question. This one from... The Lumpian Lodge says both religions worship the creator. Matters Now says, Daniel, why did you falsify Judaism, Islam, and Christianity with your opening arguments? Seems like you beat yourself. And they well, say, after I... show on Matters Now. <laughs> but my interlocutor, David, here was generous enough to say that what I have said is accurate. So I'll trust what David says. And if there was something that was inaccurate that I stated, then I'm happy for anyone to point it out, like point out where was the mistake, where was the misrepresentation. But thankfully, my interlocutor confirmed that what I was saying, at least in citing different texts, uh, primary references, that they're accurate. 
There's one from Eli. Says, exceptions, but, not rules. But he's saying you weren't falsifying statements as far as I knew everything you said. And even your, uh, you know, so to say, heretical, actually, uh, you know, most uh, Israeli uh, professors, academics agree with that you weren't falsifying. But I would say that's not, you know, how Jews understand it and say, you know, those are exceptions, not rules. This one from Eli says, doesn't Daniel's opening debunk all Abrahamic faiths, though? Um, yeah, it debunks, it debunks Judaism and Christianity. It doesn't debunk Islam. Because Islam is not dependent on the Torah or the Talmud. The Christianity, is, Judaism is obviously dependent on the Torah being authentic. Christianity depends on the Torah uh, or the Old Testament on being, uh, being authentic. But Islam doesn't depend on the Old Testament or the, the Hebrew Bible being authentic. So it does refute, <laughs> it does debunk those two, but not Islam. Oh, in the live chat, which claim. side... I said we didn't get into the historical claims in terms of the, like uh, you know the historical Abraham or something like that, which we might largely agree on, even to say who has the accurate message of the historical Abraham. Well, in the live chat, which side did you find most persuasive tonight? Islam, Judaism, pie, or I don't care. I'm a self-eating soy boy. Vote now, and we'll publish a poll at the end. This one coming in from. Thanks very much, Sultan. Appreciate your support. This one coming in from Dagwar says, God did not reveal his personal name, Yahweh, which doesn't mean God, to Muhammad. It never appears in the Quran because Muhammad didn't know it because he was a false prophet. Allah is not Yahweh. Um, Yahweh I am. They uh, apparently disagree with you, Daniel. We'll give you a chance to respond. Now, how do you know what the personal name of God is? Are you relying on the Talmud or are you relying on the Torah? Are you relying on Midrash or what are you relying on to make the claim that this is God's personal, most special name? Um, because if it is those texts, then those te texts are inauthentic. You can't tell me what is really coming from God and what it's someone just made up or rabbis just made up. So until you can authenticate your texts, then you don't really have a leg to stand on. You got it. Thanks very much for your question. Matters now it says if Allah is unknowable and Muhammad claimed to understand it and portrayed a true message, then Muhammad must have lied because Allah is unknowable. Uh, so the entirety of God and his modality or kafia and, and, and his attributes that can be um, that can be unknowable. Uh, to humanity because God is beyond human ken. Uh, however, there are aspects of God that are knowable and he has let the creation know him uh, through revelation. Um, and that's the biggest blessing and a joy of this human existence is to know God and those aspects of God that he has revealed to humanity. And that's something that um, Muslims, Jews and Christians can all agree on. You've got this one coming in from Jova Shade. Thanks so much. Says my respect to both debaters. A quote I live by is quote, if you don't know what you're saying, how do you know what you're talking about? Question to both. What is the difference between a religion and a cult? I personally uh, you know, think cult has been given on fairly negative connotations and you could understand Judaism as a cult. Uh, you know, historically you say the temple cult it was only in the 60s where you had uh, you know you have, uh, movements of uh, you, you know, God forbid that led to disaster in the U.S. where cult developed a negative connotation. So I mean, cult historically had a different meaning than it has today. And under classical terminology, I think you could define uh, Judaism or Islam as a cult. You got it. Any other questions, or I should say, responses from you, <laughs> Daniel? Yeah, cult has a certain kind of sociology that is very different from religion. Um, I'm not a sociologist, but there is like an academic distinction between a re religion and a cult. Uh, cult, usually there is like a personality um, where, the re where the cult lives and dies with that personality, um, with that person, um, whereas religion is, is broader. Religion is, yeah, there are prophets or there are central figures or founders of the religion, but the idea is that 
that person is pointing to bigger principles that exist beyond himself um, or outside of himself. So off the top of my head, like that's a big way that I would dis distinguish Christianity, for example, from Scientology or, um, you know, any of these other modern day cults. This one from I, Judas, says Muslim skeptic, more like mud slime skeptic. Wow. Oh. Eli says... Oh, that hurts. <laughs> Eli says, it's amusing that Muslims call people Islamophobes, considering the term is based on homophobia. Islamophobia is based off of homophobia? It's they say that Islamophobia, the term, or Islamophobe as a term, is based on homophobia, namely... Just because it's use the word phobia. Yeah, yeah, I think it's just Greek etymology. Arachnophobia. It actually came from arachnophobia. Matters. <laughs> Matters now says, Daniel, can you confirm Hebrew language is ancient? Yeah, uh, Hebrew language is uh, one of the oldest Semitic languages. It's not the oldest Semitic language. Uh, Assyrian, for example, I believe, or Babylonian um, are older. Um, I could be wrong on that. But yeah. What's the point? You got it. This one from Man 1010 says, Worship the Kaaba. It's obvious and similar. Why not? Worship the Kaaba. Kaaba uh -huh. is, you know, in Mecca. We don't worship the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the house of God. It's like a, you know, a place of worship. So we don't worship the Kaaba. You know, there's not nothing special about the bricks that are used to build the Kaaba. It's like any other building. Um, the bricks that the Kaaba has now didn't exist a hundred years ago. Every periodically they replace the bricks. So there's nothing holy about the, the structure, the building. It's the land where the land is that's holy and Muqaddas, you know, that is sacred. Uh, so we're not worshiping the, uh, the actual building. But, or the cube um, we're worshiping toward in one direction. And that directionality is again found in Judaism and Christianity. It's something that is found particularly in what you want to call quote unquote Abrahamic faiths, even though I disagree with the term Abrahamic, but we direct the worship towards, you know, a certain direction, but ultimately the object is to worship God himself. Now, if there's, Re figural, figural representation like a crucifix or like a statue of a person, then that's very different than worshiping the, in the direction of the Kaaba. You got it. This one coming in from I, Judas says, quote, and the high holy ones will receive the kingdom and they will inherit the kingdom forever and to all eternity, unquote, Daniel 718. Any it's thoughts? just the Bible quote. Yeah, I wasn't sure what they were getting at. Malavia, thanks for your support. Says can't watch James, uh, can't, can't watch live James, but love you, brother. Thanks so much, Malavia. Seriously, Sammy Hamden says David, do agree with the IDF using Judaism in justifying the massacre in Gaza? Well, it's not fundamentally. It doesn't matter whether I agree or not. Man has free will. Um, you say if it's immoral action, I would stand against it. Um, if people are using Judaism to justify sinful behavior, I would stand against sinful behavior, uh, but I'm limited in what I could do, and uh, you know, people have free will. You got it. This is coming in from, do appreciate it, Sultan says, why don't the Jews accept Jesus, in parentheses, peace be upon him, as the Messiah, who is their Messiah instead? Yeah, I mean, similarly, like I mentioned, the Judeo understanding of Esau and uh, Ishmael and uh, leading to uh, you know, the eventual uh, redemption in Messianic times. But uh, Jews uh, generally close the canon with the Ezra and Nehemiah in Chronicles and the rebuilding of the Second Temple. And there won't be another prophet until Messiah comes that would preclude the ability of Jesus or Muhammad to be prophets. You got it. This one coming in from. Do appreciate it. Even the Lord says to Daniel, "Would you prefer Iran to be a world superpower if they believed in Zoroastrianism?" To David, why were or are the Jews hated around the world? 
go to you first, Daniel. Would you prefer Iran to be a world superpower if they believed in Zoroastrianism? No. Well, I don't even understand the what that question is getting at. I reject Zoroastrianism as a false religion, and they only have like 112,000 followers in the whole world, so it's a dying religion. There's no way that would ever be like a superpower or an influence on the world. So I don't know what he's driving at with that. Me yeah, I would, uh, I would reject that Jews, I mean, there is um, animosity towards Jews or even I mentioned, you know, the Sinai, the, but I would say, no, I mean, generally Jews are one of the more popular people. Philo-Semitism is generally uh, uh, larger than anti-Semitism, uh, but it's based on Jewish action when Jews behave, why, uh, you know, while people are philo-Semitic, when we behave poorly, uh, they're anti-Semitic. And even Daniel, I, I would uh, you know say that he's probably more philo-Semitic than anti-Semitic, even though he has sharp criticism. He, uh, he also has a sharp praise for different aspects. So I don't think there is uh, overwhelming anti-Semitism. Uh, but you know, God forbid, if uh, we continue with the behavior in Gaza, uh, that could change. But do you, one thing, question that I have: Do you think that this accusation of anti-Semitism is used as a tool, like to silence critics of Jewish behavior, unfairly? Because I've been accused, of, you know, because of my criticism of Israel, uh, the ADL has called me an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist, which I I think it's a defam defamatory claim against me because uh, I'm not anti-Semitic. But, you know, do you think that that's a fair or is this a tool that's being used against people who criticize Jewish behavior that is objectively uh, problematic, even from a Jewish perspective? I don't use the label anti-Semitic. I don't think people are one dimensional. People have, uh, you know, hatred and love in their heart and make judgments. And I, I would say, God forbid, from what I researched of you, that your criticism of Judaism in Israel largely started recently, specifically with the actions of the uh, IDF and uh, human rights abuses in Gaza. And I would uh, warn my fellow Jews to be extremely careful about, uh, you know, the human rights atrocities we're committing in Gaza and that it turned people that are probably naturally philo-Semitic into, uh, you know, some of our big, uh, biggest critics like, uh, like Daniel. This one coming in from Sultan says, James, thanks for your kind words, Sultan. Patrit Velasi says, what was the religion of Abraham's people called according to Judaism? Was that to me? I didn't catch that exactly. Uh, I think so. Yeah, that's according to Judaism. What was the religion of Abraham called? Well, I don't know if it had a language. I mean, according to the Judeo legend, maybe Islamic also, Abraham was the first person, according to his own free will, that recognized the creator and decided to voluntarily submit. And it doesn't necessarily have a name. However, you know, the understanding was it, Abraham was given certain promises that uh, uh, the prophecies, humanity, would be uh, rectified through his offspring. Uh, which includes Islam, the descendants of Ishmael and Esau, but mostly uh, the Jewish people. Uh, there's dispute among Jews. Mo most of the sages don't hold that Abraham is Jewish or Isaac and that Jacob is the first Jew. So Abraham is the father of multiple religions, including Christianity and Islam, or some people say all world traditions. Got it. This one coming in from Jocko says, talk about Muslim heaven, please. What's it look like? So um, heaven is, or what's called Jannah or paradise, in, is described in detail in the Quran. It's also described uh, in hadith or statements of the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him. So, you know, it's paradise. It's paradise. There is no pain. There is no suffering. Um, it is filled with all kinds of delights. Um, gardens, you know, beautiful, lush gardens, palaces made of gold, and crystal and servants who serve you, uh, creations that have been created by God who are just there for serving you um, and making sure that every um, you know joy that you want to experience, you can experience. So it, that's um, you know physically what paradise is like. But the greatest uh, joy of paradise is being with the prophets, being with the uh, pious people, the salihin, and then ultimately also being with God and being able to see God um, and, and having that vision of God that is possible within heaven 
that is the number one uh, pleasure and joy of heaven beyond, you know, the uh, rivers of milk and honey, um, beyond anything else. Uh, that is the primary um, beauty and joy of heaven is to actually behold uh, the divine. You got it. This one coming in from Eli says the best Jewish thinker was Spinoza. And this one coming in from Sultan says, is Judaism a race or religion? If it's a race, then all Jews are racist. Under Islam, anyone, regardless of their race, can become a Muslim. Islam is for all mankind, and Jews say the same. Yeah, I don't think those David, I think this really necessarily I follow. Them. I'm saying if Judaism is a race, it's factual. It's not necessarily racism. Racism is how people view others. Um, whether you look at Jew, these terms are difficult to say. Like Judaism is a heritage of the descendants of Jacob that is multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, but uh, to call it a race or even ethnic group, it, the terminology is very difficult. And, and say racism is a state of mind. Um, and, uh, you know, some Jews are racist, some Jews are anti-racist. This one coming in from, do appreciate it, all the way from Detroit. Folks, let me know in the chat where you're watching from. I always love what... Uh, yeah, David's in Detroit. Uh, David, you're in Detroit? Yep. Wow. Oh, you're, so this guy, okay, this guy could be like 20 minutes from you. He says, as someone who lives in Detroit, I am looking into becoming a Muslim, but it seems like I am unwanted for being white. Daniel, do you have any advice for me to join? I don't know who doesn't want you to become Muslim because you're white. That's shocking to hear. Uh, I'm not denying that there could be some Muslims who are anti-white racists. Unfortunately, there are, I think there are some. Uh, but this is completely contrary to Islam. Islam is open to all races. And we are more than welcome someone who is white, brown, Asian, whatever. Jewish to become a Muslim. So if there's if there's one group or one mosque that you went to and you didn't have the best experience or you felt this kind of animosity because of your race, try somewhere else. You know, there, especially in Michigan, there are so many mosques. It's like one of the biggest uh, Muslim communities in America is in Michigan, especially in uh, Dearborn and, and surrounding Detroit. So just go and try to find Muslims that you feel at peace with, that you enjoy hanging out with and socializing with and that you feel comfortable in your own skin and um, accept Islam. Don't hesitate. Yeah, I just mentioned being here in Metro Detroit, um, I interfaith, you know, there's the Islamic Unity Center, Imam Alahi, uh, you know, good man, many white converts there. There's the Islam, uh, sorry, the, uh, that's uh, Imam Alasi, there's the Islamic Wisdom Center. Um, and there's the uh, uh, the largest mosque in the U.S., Imam Kazimi, and uh, I've interfaith with all of those uh, men, you know, reasonable, good men, and there's lots of white converts at all of those mosques. You got it. This one from thanks so much, Eli. Says question for David: Should Gentiles convert to Judaism? No, I mean generally conversion is not encouraged. That's why I said uh, the the important thing is action. Be a good person. Um, you could become a good person through any tradition, Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, um, you know, Shintoism, even atheism, agnosticism. Uh, God will judge you on your heart and your belief. Man should judge you on your action. So uh, you know, in that respect, uh, if you really want to be Jewish, you can become Jewish. It's very difficult, It's, uh, uh, but it, it's possible. But the, the key thing is to be a good person. You got it. How difficult, out of curiosity, that's interesting. Like, if I were to say, can I become a Jew, what would the process look like? Is this months? From an Orthodox perspective, in, in Israel these days, I mean, you say, like, it, it's very controversial. What is uh, conversion? You could have, like, you know, some six-week uh, course and, uh, you know, join a liberal temple. But from Orthodox perspective, you have to follow the law, live as an Orthodox Jew, for a year. So as I mentioned, there's not a declaration of belief. Uh, it's uh, an acceptance of the practice and a loyalty to the Jewish people. And so much so that you actually have to fully do all of the Orthodox, follow all of the Orthodox law for a year, and then you could become accepted as a Jew. So, you know, if you did want to become a Jew, find your local Orthodox synagogue. It'll take you a few years to learn how to do it. And then you actually gotcha. have to do it under supervision for a year. 
Wow. Okay. This one from Even Lord says it's someone who maybe we got that one. And Sultan says, I don't believe in God today, lol. And then it's Isa Kabir it says, structurally, how is Allah Sunna wa Jama Sunni in parentheses Islam different than that of rabbinic Judaism when they both engage law through the lens of sages? I think I answered that during the debate. There's, it's a misconception to think that uh, there's parallels between ulama, like religious scholars in Islam, interpreting the Quran and Sunnah, and rabbis interpreting the Torah and the Talmud. There, there are very significant differences. I mentioned some of them in the debate, um, like the whole idea between ulama, like Muslim scholars. Uh, studying the Quran and Sunnah and coming up with rulings, uh, making rulings is that the ulama are trying to understand what did God intend? You know, what what is God's intention? Like, what does God want us to do? Um, that is the primary. And then the way to to find the answer to that is to go to his revelation, to go to the Quran, to go to what his final prophet has said. The mindset within rabbinic Judaism is very different. The, the rabbis are not, they don't actually care about the intentions of God. Like, what did God intend uh, with the Torah? Be this is the doctrine of the Torah is not in heaven. Um, and this is why they can introduce laws. They can uh, cancel out laws like Lexus Talionis, the eye for an eye. Um, this is the whole idea behind Oven of Achnai, um, which is a very amazing story, like because of its audacity, like basically the rabbis say explicitly, like even when there's a divine voice from heaven and God is saying this is the correct ruling, this is the correct position on some, some aspect of the law, the rabbis say, no, 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 the Torah is not in heaven. The majority rule, the majority of rabbis say something. So that is what the law, the religious law should be. And then when the, when the rabbi has said this, God says from heaven, my children have triumphed over me. <laughs> So God is, according to the Talmud, is acknowledging that the rabbis are actually smarter and are have argued more correctly than God himself. So this is this is the idea that the Torah is not in heaven. The rabbis don't even care what what God intended when he said something in the Torah. Um, so this is a very big uh, structural difference between uh, Islamic interpretation of scripture versus the Jewish interpretation. And gematria is something that we didn't even talk about. Like gematria defies natural language, like to give every letter a number within the Talmud and to do calculations and then to derive rulings based on like numbers uh, and this kind of numerology or coded language uh, of the Torah. This is not found in Islam at all, but a lot of Judaism and the Jewish laws are, are based on gematria. You got it. This one coming in from appreciate it matters now it says to both what happens to people who believe God does not exist since five years old is moral otherwise, though, and they're incapable of belief in a God Do they go to heaven or hell. Like I said, God judges people in the totality of all of their thoughts, actions, speaks. God knows that, you know, the depth of our minds, our desires and uh, that will be one of the factors that God judges us on, um, but uh, it will include everything. And uh, you generally say that action is more important. So even if you weren't a believer, but you were a good person, presumably the totality of the action would give someone a positive judgment. Yeah, yeah in yeah. Islam, like it's similar, like the totality of the judgment like from five years old, I don't know if someone can not believe in God at five years old unless they've been indoctrinated by atheistic parents or atheistic culture. Every child uh, is born with the fitra, believing in uh, God and, and adoring God. Um, and then it's the parents or the culture that will turn people into atheists. And this is something that's been actually confirmed by the cognitive science of religion and studies by um, researchers like Olivera Petrovich um, and, and others I've cited in other debates. But um, if someone is really like mentally uh, has mental problems, uh, suffering from insanity, and they don't believe in God, then they're not held accountable for that. They won't be punished. But if someone uh, doesn't is sane, uh, rejects God, uh, is an atheist, and dies, then um, all else being equal, that person is condemned to the hellfire. 
You got it. This one coming in. Appreciate your question, too. Actually, just to give you a chance to respond as well, David, sorry about that. I jumped over. If they can't believe and they haven't believed since five years old, do they go to heaven or hell if they've been I that first. otherwise? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Long day, guys. I'm sorry. I'm super No problem. I'm glad to see a lot of questions. Aftershave says, David, snap out of it. Don't educate. Light the coals? What does this mean? Sultan says, under the Sharia, Jews and Christians are classified as protected people if they pay a tax. Is there such a protection for Christians under the Jewish law? Well, until recently, as a leaning anti-Zionist uh, to say that you should have Jewish law where you had non-Jews subject to it. So with the state of Israel, that would only be applicable to Israel. And unfortunately, I think that Israel is not uh, doing justice to the uh, concerns that minority in protection, um, you know, generally Jews, uh, we have our own system of law, but we live according to the law of the land. And, uh, you know, one of the points me and Daniel semi argued over, but it was this concept of progress and a liberalizing effect of uh, the rabbinic system in Judaism as opposed to Islam. So we, you know, no longer have the death penalty or things like slavery have been uh, eradicated and a move towards liberalization that uh, Daniel looks at negative. But you look in the state of Israel where all of a sudden you have Jews under self-rule uh, self and somewhat a reversion to biblical law that uh, gets rid of the liberalization and and that you know, could have, as seen, God forbid, uh, you know, what we're seeing in Gaza or the way that Jews might interpret how they feel they should handle dealing with their minority populations, unfortunately. This is coming in from, appreciate your question. Actually, let this load up for a second. Joshua, I know you said you wanted me to combine your questions. They said, Daniel, mm -hmm. you have used the fact that child marriage has been going on in the past for centuries as an argument for adults being allowed to sleep with children. This is an appeal to history fallacy. What are your thoughts, Daniel? No, it's a misunderstanding of the argument um, and using the word child marriage is polemical. I've argued for minor marriage because the whole point is that when a person hits puberty, they're no longer a child. And this is a universal concept. Um, the argument is not that, oh, well, they did it in the past, so therefore it's right. That's not the argument that I've made. The point that I've made is that there are certain things that are just structural to human beings and human life. And one of the things that is universal to human life is the process of puberty. And at a certain point, a human being is going to go through puberty and start having sexual desires. Their body is going to change. They're going to desire to have sex. And that happens at puberty. What age is that? That age can be as young as eight. In fact, 1% to 2% of all people uh, or all girls hit puberty at age eight or nine, 4%. Uh, up to age nine, they've already hit puberty. So when they hit puberty, they're no longer children in the sense that they don't desire sex. There are nine-year-olds who have hit puberty and they desire sex and they become sexually active. And because of the degenerate liberal system that we live under, uh, there are all these nine-year-olds in schools that are sexually active. And they're actually quite promiscuous because that's all that they know. Whereas in most of history, the, the correct and morally correct thing to do is when you have a sexual desire, that desire should be fulfilled. It should not be repressed, but you do that in the sanctity of marriage. And this is why uh, Christians have sanctified marriage uh, of minors way below the uh, age of 18 years old of majority, according to uh, Western culture, um, uh, Judaism. They have sanctioned marriage with minors. Why? Because it's based on puberty. It's based on this biological um, milestone that every human being hits. Islam has done it. Hinduism has done it. Buddhism has done it. Even uh, atheistic cultures that don't believe in God, they have had minor marriage because this is something natural. This is something that's universal. So to, uh, to argue against Islam on the basis of something that is universal is ridiculous like it's not a coherent or cogent argument explain instead why in one particular point in history this kind of aversion to minor marriage has uh, has uh, erupted in the culture that's what the, that's what needs explanation that's what needs a kind of analysis so why has this become something that's taboo that was 
practice universally without objection. No one was criticizing the concept of minor marriage a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, let alone millennia ago. There was nothing. There was no objection because it was as natural as you know eating and drinking and sleeping and everything else that human beings do. So why has this become such a big problem in the modern age? It's because of uh, the socialization and this idea of schooling that you need to go to school, grade school until you're 18 years old and then you go into the workforce like this kind of capitalistic system that uh, wants to create more workers to be cogs in this capitalist machine. You have to tell people, oh, don't get married. Don't get married until you're after 18 years old. Otherwise, you know, that's something so wrong and that's so immoral. Yeah, that serves capitalism. That serves this kind of capitalist model, but there's nothing inherently immoral to getting married under the age of 18 years old, and there's nothing inherently immoral with being sexually active under 18 years old. The West, the liberal West, with all of its human rights, accepts that an under 18-year-old minor can be sexually active active. There's no problem with that as long as it's fornication, as long as it's, you know, sleeping around and having whatever kind of casual sex. But as soon as you talk about marriage, oh, that's child marriage. You guys are doing child marriage. This is the worst kind of evil. This is incoherent. It makes no sense. And I've answered every single debate we have this in the Q&A. And I always give the same answer. So it's find another, another of, uh, find another argument against one. Islam. It's another example of the difference between rabbinical legal precedents and Islamic, where Sharia law is almost the same as Mosaic or call it Abrahamic law, but uh, Jewish law liberalized over the ages. And, uh, you know, so now even among the most uh, orthodox, you wouldn't have child marriage below 16. And, uh, you know, maybe places like Yemen or Morocco, it was earlier, but the process of rabbinic law that had a liberalization process. We'll jump into the next one. Thank you I mean, very much for this. That's, to me, when you say the liberalization process, that's another example of corruption. Like It's been the influence of the liberal world order that has pressured Jews to change their religion. No one prior to the 20th century or the 19th century, let's say, had a problem in Judaism with minor marriage. No one had a problem with it. But I'm because of... Critique. I'm just saying that Judaism's method allowed that to change, even though... The Sharia law is basically comparable to how Jews practiced at the time, but the Jewish mechanism had a method to change, and uh, it's very rare to see Jews practicing that today. Um, no, it's, make, it's making the religion a joke. Obviously, you disagree with that, but uh, it's yeah, it makes this is the this is the liberal method to destroy religion because once you say, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, minor marriage is evil. Yeah, that's child marriage. It's so evil. If you say that, then you're throwing your prophets under the bus. You're throwing many, uh, much, many aspects of the Bible under the bus. You're throwing the previous sages under the bus because you're basically saying that, yeah, they're all pedophiles and we reject that. So liberals count on you uh, changing your religion. Our ancestors. We're saying you we are, have, you are. We when have you change the law, you are. change and adapt. Yeah, but that, but that, announcing our ancestors it's inconsistency at it's, the time. It, saying we have a method. What the liberal, what the liberal Islam points doesn't out doesn't have in the same manner. What the liberal points out is that your religion is inconsistent. You've changed your morality. That means that it can't be from God because you're updating and you're changing it because of political pressure. So therefore, your religion is a joke, and that's why people will leave the religion. They'll say that, well, how how is this serious? Right now, in 21st century, this is considered wrong, but throughout history, it was practiced. So that means that it's not really a religion from God. It's just whatever people make up at the time. So if to resist the liberal pressure is to actually preserve your religious beliefs and to say that, no, my religion is from God. If God allowed that in the past and said that this is permissible, this is moral, then that means it's moral. And it's moral today as well in, in the proper context. I got to move forward. This one from I, Judas Fly says, Daniel, quote unquote, in Gematria is equal to Hammond, dot, 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 95. I don't get the reference. Modi Han I mean, says, Daniel is just thoughts? a tool for having deeper understanding of mystical ideas. You can't derive law from it. Um, I mean, if he's, I'm not, I didn't do the mathematics. I mean, if he's trying to attack you, like you're like Haman or a Moloch, uh, you know, God forbid, I, I know Judas, but uh, you know, generally I'm, I'm not personally attacking anybody. Um, so, you know, that's unfortunate. This one from Modi Khan says, Daniel, thoughts on Kirat and seven Aruf? 
Oh, Qiraat and the seven Ahruf. Yeah, the Qiraat, yeah. um, these are revealed by God. Um, the seven Ahruf, these are revealed by God. And the Qiraat, the recitations and modes of recitation of the Quran, I've revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu They've been preserved, they're mass transmitted through Tawatur. And this is no problem uh, with you know, this doesn't create a problem for the authenticity of the Quran because they've all been preserved as well. They're just different modes of recitation. Um, so uh, the, the variants that we see with the Bible, as I mentioned, like they are major variants, like does God have sons or not? Um, that is the, the variation within like the Masoretic text versus the Dead Sea Scrolls versus the Septuagint, etc. Those have major, massive theological implications. Or within uh, the New Testament, you know, the the Gospel of Mark, you know, the ending of Gospel of Mark, is that something that has been added or not? Well, that has major theological implications for Christianity. There's nothing like that in, in the Quran. The variants in the Qur'at are differences like the difference between يَعْمَلُونَ وَتَعْمَلُونَ, like uh, they do versus you all do. Like that's the kind of variation. Like it has no theological implications and they have been preserved. So this is a category difference between variation in the Qira'at of the Qur'an and the varia variance with the uh, Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. This one, Ram, appreciate it. Dagwar says, if all prophets were Muslim, how do you explain the existence of Judaism as a faith? Why did Judaism emerge if all its prophets were Muslim? Why does the word Judaism exist? Allah just at failed i think they're saying did allah just fail it's another wording of the question i put to you that to some extent uh, islam necessitates some element of judaism being true and from your perspective how do you explain that judaism exists if uh, you're saying that well the prophets existed they were muslims but then how how do you explain the arisal of judaism i mean that's like saying like oh the existence of uh nation of islam the existence of nation of Islam disproves Islam. Nation of Islam, like the religion of uh, Elijah Muhammad and the minister Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan, that believes like the white people are the devil and black people were whatever. Like th that has nothing to do with Islam, but it's the nation of Islam. It aro arose in the 20th century. Uh, how does the nation of Islam exist? Well, it's made up like some someone just makes up a religion uh, Someone or someone takes a religion that has been revealed and distorts it like Islam They take Islam and they just add and subtract and they create their own religion the same uh, with Qadianism Ismailism, you know the five percenters all of these different religions that have been created that they don't uh, basically they don't uh, uh, they don't, what's the word? They don't cancel out the previous revelation. They don't cancel out the Quran or Islam. In the same way, the prophets preached monotheism. They preached, they were Hanif, and this is the Quranic mm. term. They were monotheists, and then that was corrupted. Uh, all of this polytheism was added, and that's how Judaism was created. The Judaism that has this corrupted Torah, the corrupted Talmud, the corrupted law overall, uh, corrupted beliefs. All of this is corruption. But the prophets, uh, up to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they practice monotheism, belief in one God alone that we all must submit to. Um, so the Islam acknowledges those prophets and their monotheism. It doesn't acknowledge Judaism. It doesn't acknowledge the Talmud and uh, and all of these bizarre beliefs and practices. Of course not. But does it not in from? claim that the uh, Jews are actually the descendants? Uh, I, I hate to do this, but we just oh, have yeah, so sure. many questions. I got to keep. I got to keep moving. This one from Danny D. Soul says, got timed out, James. Okay, sorry about that. Joshua Jamie says, Daniel, you have said that in cultures where child slash adult marriage isn't considered taboo, there are less reports of trauma from children being in these relationships. However, these same cultures indoctrinate the children into a religion that prohibits them even considering it to be abuse. Your culture is indoctrinating people to think that it is abuse. What's your point? Wayward Wiz says, question to David. The Ram Bam said if one of the 13 principles is violated, such as disbelief in God based on mood, the person is considered a heretic. Yeah, but saying that belief is a commandment to say, well, you did a sin. 
just like, uh, you know, if you didn't give charity or you mistreated somebody or didn't fulfill one of the rituals, uh, that, uh, so it means that's all it is. It's just one of the laws, it, although it's a constant law, as opposed to a reoccurring law that may be like a ritual that's meant to be done once a day or charity that's obligated when it's in front of you. These uh, commandments of belief are constantly commanded upon the heart. And if you fail to uh, have the proper belief at the time, it's a constant uh, sin. Raruni Tenshin says, it's kind of crazy to hear Daniel defend the death sentence for not believing. Islam is a lot scarier than the media makes it out to be. Literally every single debate, I explain it uh, and put it in terms that people can understand. So, and a lot of people find it very reasonable. And, uh, you know, I was on the Patrick Bet Bet David podcast speaking uh, or debating with two Islamophobes and they brought this up. Oh, the death penalty uh, for apostasy. And I explained it very easily and clearly. Uh, thanks, you know, alhamdulillah, thanks to God. And Patrick was like, yeah, I kind of, I see, you know, ultimately I don't agree, but I can see the logic of it. I can see, you know, that you do have to deter um, uh, people exiting a group and you have to deter people from, uh, you know, apostatizing. That's something that every religion has. So he, he got it. A lot of people get it. Um, and, and some people, val they see that as Islam, like sticking up for its principles and not bending to the liberal mindsets, the liberal mind control. And Andrew Tate is one of these people. I keep pointing him out. Andrew Tate says that, you know, what he respects about Islam is that they don't tolerate blasphemy. They don't tolerate, you know, these kinds of attacks on religion. They have laws that uh, deter that kind of uh, disrespect towards God. And that is godly. And I respect that. And as a Christian, I respect that. And then eventually he became Muslim. So people get it like this is not rocket science and I can explain it a million times. But if you don't want to believe and you want to just hate Islam, go ahead. This one coming in from do appreciate it. Wayward Wiz says, David, how come some sects curse Ishmael while other sects say he's blessed based on promise from God? So do you guys hate Ishmael or love him? I don't think there's a cursing. There's I mean, it's a way to understand history and the unfolding of prophecy and also, you know, regional geopolitics is, uh, you know, some of my rabbis always referred to, um, uh, you know, Khomeini and uh, Nasrallah as Ishmaelites, uh, you know, descendants of the prophet, descendant of Ishmael, um, but uh, not necessarily the, the curse. They have a role they play in history that could be uh, good or bad and uh, that's somewhat uh, dependent, although you will find that, you know, Jews might curse Ishmael, but it's not necessarily a part. You might find it in text, uh, but it's, it's more just a way of understanding prophecy and the unfolding of history. It's not a fundamental aspect of Judaism. You got it. This one from Yavuz Alarizia says, Hey, David, what is your biggest doubt or problem stopping you from reverting to Islam? Other than, quote, Islam doesn't falsify Judaism, which isn't true. Surely you believe in objective truth. Yeah, I, I didn't see any claim of, you know, say so to say, follow Muhammad. I mean, I mean, respecting Daniel's argument. I mean, generally, I follow the tradition of the prophets, the unbroken tradition, the sages of the generation, and I don't see a precedence to follow Muhammad or that there's anything. Even if Muhammad is coming to revive and correct the message of the old the uh, of the Hebrew prophets, he says, well, thank you for setting me back on the proper path. But uh, I don't see a necessity to accept Islam or follow Muhammad. Um, and, you know, if Daniel was correct in these things, well, thank you for uh, putting me on the right path. But I'm still going to continue to follow the Hebrew prophets. Well, how does how would Muhammad have how can he correct the Torah unless he's also a prophet of God? Well, I'm saying the Genesis, I'm saying he's a prince of God, not a prophet, that uh, it's an element of the prophecy of Abraham of the 12 princes but not a prophet. And even if you raise the standard to say, he's not my prophet, he's your prophet. And uh, if the if there is corrections, let, let's say theoretically that there was corruption in the Hebrew uh, tradition and Muhammad is accurately as a descendant of Ishmael or through some sort of uh, connection to God called prophecy to correct the message of the Hebrew prophets, I still don't see any reason why I should become Muslim. I should just uh, uh, become a better Jew. So, uh, you know, like I didn't feel any compelling reason to uh, become Muslim from this debate.
Although it did compel this, me that I could try to become a better Jew. This one from God's servant says, how does one attain salvation according to Islam? How is salvation at attained? Yes. Salvation means just to uh, believe in God and believe in his messenger, uh, his final messenger, Muhammad Wasallam. believe in the prophets, believe in the angels, believe in the books that have been sent, like the Torah, the Injil sent to Jesus Christ, uh, the Suhuf sent to Abraham, the Zabur sent to David, Prophet David, and the Quran, um, uh, to believe in the final day and, and the um, Qadr of Allah or the power of Allah, uh, good or bad. These six pillars of belief or iman that's required to have faith um and then that's that salvation that salvation um you have to also do good deeds you have to um follow the commands of god which is what are found in islamic law but they're basically summarized i mean they're not contained just in the five pillars but the five pillars are the main requirements um, which is to pray uh, the five daily prayers to fast in the month of Ramadan to pay zakat, which is the charity, um, the mandatory charity every year, if you can afford it to do Hajj and to testify that there's no God, but Allah and that Muhammad is his final messenger. Um, and then, uh, when you die, then everyone is judged by God on the day of judgment. Um, and then if you have Iman and you have, uh, good deeds, then God, ex uh, if God accepts that your deeds, like you didn't have hypocrisy, then you are saved. But it's possible that you're a Muslim and you're punished in hell because you committed a lot of sins or you were neglectful with your prayers. Then you could be punished for a period of time in the hellfire. But if you have Iman, the belief uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, then you will eventually be saved, even though you might be punished. But if you reject God, and you reject his final messenger and you don't believe, uh, then you are punished in, in, in the hellfire, even if you have good deeds, even if, if you're a good person, quote unquote, good person, uh, and you're charitable and you're helping people, uh, but you rejected God, then uh, you have failed the test of life because God has sent messengers. He sent the final messenger um, and requires submission as we are creation of God. We should submit to God when he sends a final messenger. We believe in him and we follow him. And he sent manifest evidence to the truth of that message and to the truth of Islam. So that's the Islamic uh, explanation of salvation. You got it. This one from Joshua Jamie says. Let's see, they got two. They say, but if an eight-year-old is a child, you repeatedly appeal to history and absolutely no study of any kind that shows an adult sleeping with a child does not damage them mentally. Yet we have copious amounts of studies showing it does. Yeah, or the studies that are based off of people today and what is considered damage um, is the study of child molestation, um, adults diddling kids in the closet, uh, child marriage, um, as you call it, or minor marriage is practiced around the world to this day. It's considered legal in many of the U S states. Actually, there's no minimum age of marriage. You might need to get consent of the parents or the guardians. But, you know, when you study those, um, those people and those communities, those families, then that mental damage or trauma is non-existent. The mental trauma comes with kids diddle, being diddled in the closet, in schools, uh, in churches, in synagogues, unfortunately. So that is where the trauma comes from, uh, not from the practice of marriage. Marriage is very different than child molestation. Yeah, this one coming in from Bull Dude Wenda or Wens 55 says, according to Judaism, Jesus can't be the Messiah because he has no lineage to King David. What is the Muslims' response to that? The, I don't know the exact lineage, but he's still part of the lineage of Isaac. Um, instead, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is from Ishmael, and Jesus is from the lineage of Isaac, which goes back to Abraham. Whether it goes through David or not, I'm not sure. But um, again, like if you're basing this off of the prophecy of a Davidic, Davidic line, 
um, and the promise made to David, then again, how do you know that that's authentic um, within the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament? That's the number one question that we need an answer to. You yeah, got it. This one for coming. more programs. We didn't get much to eschatology. It's a very wide, important topic. If there, you know, there's appetite for future debates or program, I'm open for it. This one from yeah, but in Islam we don't believe that. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Like he is the Messiah. He came, and he was taken to heaven, and then he's going to return uh, to kill the Antichrist. So the eschatology is actually very interesting because it kind of intersects Islamic eschatology intersects with Jewish and Christian eschatology. But as far as um, the Messiah uh, being Jesus Christ, Muslims and Christians are agreed on that. This one coming in from. And these are the last ones we can take on this issue, folks. I'm tempted to like skip over them already. Uh, let's see. Joshua Jamie says, but Daniel, do you agree that an eight-year-old is a child? And also says, letting adults and children sleep together just because they want to sounds pretty liberal to me. And Jocko says, what would you do if you saw Muhammad with a nine-year-old girl today? Yeah, I mean, what a silly question. I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I wouldn't have a problem with marriage. People do get married. Uh, minor marriage is practiced throughout the world. Um, so I wouldn't have a problem with it. I think that's marriage, as long as it's a legitimate marriage. Um, and uh, if it is a minor, then there are certain restrictions or certain conditions. Like the parents have to also uh, give permission. The father, I mean, the father has to give permission for a daughter, a minor daughter to get married. Um, and even a, a major daughter, it depends on the, the specific school of thought. But um, yeah, I wouldn't have a problem. I think that's the solution that we need. Like we need to have, we need to bring back marriage and practice marriage as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu practiced marriage instead of this degenerate um, reality that we are suffering from where look at the, every day there's a news story about a teacher who's been having sex with 13 year old in her class. <laughs> like in the high schools and the middle schools, even in the elementary schools. When I was going to public school, in elementary school, there were some kids that were sexually active. So if you're in the fifth grade, you're like 10 years old. You're maybe 11 years old and you're sexually active. There was no, like, and this was 25 years ago, or, or no, no, when I was in elementary school, it was over 30 years ago. Th this was something that, this is practicing, is happening every day. We need to have marriage. We need to bring back minor marriage to prevent this kind of degeneracy. Islam is the solution for all of these social ills that, the West is suffering from, but you're too blind to see the problem. You're so too blind to see how this is so destructive when a when these uh, minors are sexually active and they they accept fornication, they accept this kind of unlawful sexual behavior, and we see the consequence of this kind of liberalization with this whole uh, you know these different sexual degenerate movements that have arisen, especially in the past 20 years. This is the a direct result. You know, th these conservatives are, are quite funny to me that complain about sexual degeneracy and the, uh, you know, the alphabet movement. They complain about that and say, oh, where is the world going to? Well, guess what created that world? The, uh, a world of rampant fornication leads to more and more degeneracy. So you allowed that kind of degeneracy to exist when you were looked the other way. Oh, my my grade schooler is going on her date with her boyfriend. And oh, yeah, it's expected that if you go to prom that you're going to have sex. And yeah, that's just what kids do. Like that's all degenerate. That's all disgusting. It's against the rules of God. That's only going... That's only going to breed more degeneracy, and that's what we see in the world today. Whereas if you practiced what the people of the past practiced and what all of the prophets of the past advocated and what the Bible advocates and what the Hebrew Bible advocates we, and the Quran advocates, we wouldn't have these problems. This one coming in from, do appreciate it. John Choi says, uh, Daniel, you, okay, it's just an insult. This one from God's servant says, next, quote unquote, prophecy according to Judaism. Acts 2.38. Let's see. Wayward Wiz says, David, I didn't understand, so Ishmael is blessed? Question yes, according mark. According to uh, Genesis, each Hagar is promised by God that 12 princes will arise from the descendants of Ishmael. And if you follow the chronology of uh, the Hebrew prophets, that uh, the uh, descendants of Ishmael eventually rise to 
become the leaders of the East or the South in different phrases, that at the end of days, the world will fall into two large forces, the you know the North or South or East or West, which will largely be the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Esau or Islam and Christianity. And we'll say it's neutral, that Abraham is the father to multiple nations. And in the end of days, if humanity is worthy, we will all usher into the utopian society peacefully. And if not, there will be, uh, you know, God forbid, two great armies that uh, will wage war against each other, one of them being led by the descendants of Ishmael. You got it. With that, folks, we have gotten to the end of the questions list. I want to say we appreciate you for all being here with us, folks. We do want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, check out our guests' links in the description box. We link our guests at the podcast as well. So if you're listening to this later on the podcast, you can find Daniel and David's links in the description box there for that episode. Daniel and David, it's been a true pleasure to have you tonight. Yeah, great. We appreciate you having me on. And uh, I'm open for many other debates. And appreciate this, Daniel, if you want to talk more or have another conversation uh, to another topic. And anyone who, uh, you know, I have a much smaller following. So you can find me on social media and reach out uh, directly to me if you have any feedback or comments. Yeah, thank you so much, David. Thank you, James. Sorry if I got uh, mixed up with the timing. But yeah, I really enjoy the conversation. I wish that I invite uh, other uh, Jews to debate. If there is a rabbi out there who wants to debate, uh, we didn't talk about the Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, but he's a very popular uh, YouTuber. He has a YouTube channel and he is a rabbi. I'm open to debating any rabbi so far. Um, no one has taken me up on the cha challenge except for uh, David here. So um, yeah, that's an open challenge. Anyone who wants to debate Islam versus Judaism, uh, more than happy to do that. That reminds me, I meant to say that, so I'm glad you said that. Folks, if you happen to be Jewish and you want to debate, email me at moderndaydebate at gmail.com. We do want to have Jewish folks. This is like the first time in a long time, like years, that we have ever had a, a Jewish debater. So we hope you know you're welcome here. It's just that we, we don't get a lot of people that reach out saying that they want to make the case for Judaism. Also, Daniel has a juicy upcoming debate with a spicy Hindu fellow. And I've got to say, folks, if you happen to be a Hindu uh, who wants to debate, I didn't think that there were actually any Hindu apologists, you could call them, or kind of like the people that are like, hey, I'm going to try to reason with you to, you know, I'm going to try to give you an argument to persuade you to my faith. I didn't know that there were that there were any sort of apologetics for Hinduism at all. I didn't know they existed. And then Daniel, because he has such a way with people, got into a fight on Twitter with, with one of them. And they they were basically like, yeah, like I'll debate you. And so if you happen to be a Hindu person and the, the thing is for all of these, I hate to be such a but I have to say it because it's out there and it annoys me. Is that sometimes, you know, other people are like, oh, yeah, I'm a I'm a Christian and they're like actually an atheist like when you press them and you're like what how are you a christian like you don't even believe in a god like kind of like earlier in this discussion david you mentioned that there are some jewish folks that are they would maybe even say that they're jewishly uh, they're jewish religion wise but they don't even believe in a god that exists in christianity and there are some hindus where they reach out and they're like yeah i want i want to debate on behalf of hinduism and then we listen and i'm like that like is that hinduism i don't know what you're we're looking for you could say traditional Hindu debaters, if you're out there. Well, I'm just to remind you, debate. I think Adair Weinrub has, wants to debate uh, Joseph Cohn, who uh, I don't know if he wants to debate Daniel, but they want to debate Zionism, Jew against Jew, uh, you know, Joseph Cohn, Zionism against Adair Weinrub, a uh, mild Zionist. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's also, God forbid, for war going on that, uh, you know, I know I've talked with Adair Weinrub of Sula, who was on your channel before and is looking to uh, do more debates on your channel. You got it. I appreciate you letting me know that. And if you are a Jewish person or a Hindu person wanting to debate, I'm at moderndaydebate at gmail.com. With that, thank you very much, Daniel and David. We're going to let these guys go. It's late, and I am so exhausted. So let these guys go. I'll be back in a few seconds for a like two-minute-long post credit scene. Stick around, folks. I'll be right back. And thanks one last time to our debaters. Stick around, folks. Thank you.